morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for uh, for coming to my talk today for the next uh, two and a half ish hours. I'm here to uh, to talk to you guys about the best practices in drone survey. So thank you for having me out here. It's absolutely uh, beautiful. I've never been to uh, to this area at all before, and I absolutely love it. So thanks for having me out here. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you guys about drone surveying and really all aspects of drone surveying and how it can help, well not all aspects of, well, let me rephrase, all aspects of drone surveying, not all aspects of drones, um, and how you guys can actually use it in your businesses, how you can actually uh, use drones to make more money, save yourself some time, and get a good business uh, going with it. Now, I really like an interactive uh, session. I know it's early, I hope you guys have had your coffee. I have as well. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand, let me know. I like get back and forth, because ultimately what I'm here to do is inform you guys. So if you have questions, that's great. Please let me know, I love answering questions. I love actually uh, having a conversation with you guys as we go through this. Um, so a little bit first about myself and about Aerotas as a company, about what we do. Uh, we do drone data processing for land surveyors, and we've been around since about 2014. The way that our business works, and why we know what we know is that uh, we process data, so every other people will fly the data, send it to us, so we, but because of that, we have processed tens of thousands of data of projects, seen lots of different uh, drones and workflows and data processing and GPS things, and that's how we've gotten all this information about how to actually do it right in order to save you guys time, save you money, and get the accuracy and product that you need. A little bit about myself, uh, I am the uh, president and lead photogrammetrist, so I actually come from a photogrammetric background, uh, personally. I actually worked in finance and statistics before, uh, and I'm an ASPRS certified math and scientist, which is, you know, credentials, whatever, that, you know, I actually know what I'm talking about here. Um, so, what we're gonna talk about today, first off, uh, we're gonna cover a couple of things. First of all, I'm gonna do my best to give you a summary of the last eight years of drone surveying knowledge. That's about as long as drones have actually started to be used uh, for land surveying, and obviously the technology has come an enormous way over that time, from a complete science project into something that, quite frankly, a ton of people are gonna be uh, using, um, and more and more will over the coming months and years. Which means we're going to talk about what can, what drones can do as far as collecting data, getting accuracy, getting your line work, that sort of thing. But also, more importantly, what drones should do. Because one thing that you'll hear as a theme from this talk and throughout what I talk about is just because a drone can do it doesn't mean that it should. There are a lot of projects where the drone is not the right tool for the job, and that is okay. You guys are surveyors, a drone is not anywhere near, it is never going to replace a surveyor, and it is never going to be the only tool that a surveyor has. Likewise, you guys have a million tools in your truck right now, this is just going to be one of them, and so a lot of this is helping you figure out what the right tools are, or what the right projects are for a drone, and what ones aren't the right projects for a drone. We're also going to talk about what the right drone is, there's obviously a huge amount of hardware out there, we have seen and processed data from effectively all the platforms that are out there, so we can tell you a little bit from our uh, our perspective of which ones are the best ones out there, as well as a little bit about you know where and how you fly, mission planning, a lot of those things that will lead to success down the line. Uh, because uh, to jump ahead and give a bit of a spoiler, a lot of the success in processing data actually comes from some of the decisions you make in terms of your flight settings and altitudes and overlapping that sort of stuff. So that's what we're going to cover. Um, like I said, we got about two and a half hours to talk. We'll have about a 15 minute break there in the middle just uh, because I can talk fast and be overwhelming. I know a lot of people want to break, so that's totally fine with uh, with me. Oh, last thing I forgot one bullet point. We're talking about how to process data as well. Um, so those are kind of our objectives, but if there is one overarching goal of what I want to, you to get away from this presentation, it's that if your drone program isn't saving you time and money, then it's not working. The way that our philosophy to approaching this is, as much as, I mean, honestly, myself and a lot of other people love the technology. It's a really cool technology. We don't want to make this a science fair project. We don't want to make this a crazy big $100,000 weight that you bought because, cool, flying robots with lasers, yeah, let's do it. 
and then you start using it and you realize it's a pain and it takes more time and it's so expensive and you just go back to doing things the old way. My way is to actually make sure that not only we're getting you the data you need, but you're doing it in a way that saves you time and saves you money. So there's very much a business aspect to this. I do love the technology, but the technology isn't everything. It's a lot about the workflow, the processes, the routine to take this really cool technology and quite frankly, to make it extraordinarily boring. That's a big top part of what I do, is take this fascinating tech and make it boring so that you or anyone else in your company can go out to the field, <coughs> set up your tripod, push the drone, hit go, and then watch it buzz around for 20 minutes. It's incredibly boring, and that's obviously the way that it should be because that's what makes it a good business. So for us, a good drone program should do a couple of things. First of all, if you set it up right, it should increase your flexibility, and that means that it'll allow you to do new projects, bigger projects that you couldn't before, projects with more vegetation that you couldn't actually you know, hike through in any reasonable amount of time, uh, projects that you don't have the manpower for but you can cover, that sort of thing. It really serves as a force multiplier. The amount of area that a drone can cover is gonna be a huge, huge, huge benefit. Um, and it can scale up and down based on your need. When you do have a huge projects, you can use the drone, when you don't, you can use more of your people, it gives you a lot more flexibility. It should save time and money, like I said, a huge amount of uh, uh, reduced manpower in the field and reduce your overall costs. Now, key to that is making sure that you do not increase your office time so much that it, over, uh, that it counteracts all the time saving the field. Uh, but also, it should actually get you better deliverables. A lot of people are under the misconception that if you use a drone, you're sacrificing something in the sense that you know, oh, I could hit, hit it with, uh, you could survey the whole thing, can topo it, or I could use a drone and that's eh, not gonna be as good. Well, actually, it should not only be as good, it should be better, because you're getting that the same accuracy as traditional surveys, but you get up-to-date imagery, you get that backing on your map so that you know exactly what's there, you can check your own previous data, that sort of stuff, and give you a perfect record of site conditions, plus just there's so much more data that you can pull than you ever could with, uh, with traditional surveying methods. But in order to do all of this, you have to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that are out there. Because there are so many ways that we've seen people shoot themselves in the foot with this. For starters, don't use the wrong tool for the job. I mentioned that before, just because you have a drone does not mean that every project site is useful for a drone. There's a, there are LiDAR drones out there, which are wonderful, but not the right tool for every job necessarily. Same thing with photogrammetry, great tool. But you also have your total station, your GPS, all the way up to airplanes and other tools as well. If you came to me and said, hey, I've got 20,000 acres of uh, you know, federal land that I need to survey, don't use a drone. Nope, you're gonna hire an aerialist for that, absolutely. And that's just one of those ideas that, you know, don't use the wrong tool for the job. We've seen people actually try and use drones on 10,000 plus acre projects, and it's, it is technologically possible, but it really is not the right tool for the job there. Also, we don't want you to overspend on gear you don't need. Don't buy a Ferrari when you need a pickup truck, right? <clears throat> Same thing with drones, but also with the computers to process it, the software. You can very, very easily spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on drones where based on the type of projects you're doing, you could get away with a fraction of that. So making sure, and that, unfortunately, that's probably one of the most common things that we see is people want to buy the best drone out there and they don't realize they're buying a drone for all sorts of stuff that they aren't actually going to be using it for. Just because it can operate in Arctic conditions doesn't mean that you need to. Um, but also don't spend too much time in the office. You can collect all of this data, bring it home and be like, wow, I was out in the field for 45 minutes, that's wonderful. And then you hand it off to a data processing tech and it, may, it might take him 40 hours to process it. That's a pretty bad trade-off if you save 10 hours in the field and spend 40 in the office. That's another pitfall that, we're gonna, that I'm gonna help walk you through how to avoid that. And also, most importantly, don't treat this like a research project. For better or worse, you know, we and other companies like us have gone through the extreme pain of learning a lot of these workflows so that you don't have to treat this like a research project, that you don't have to build this from the ground up. You don't have to reinvent the wheel of how to actually use a drone to gather good survey data, get it in a CAD, and put it on a final field survey because a research project is going to be extraordinarily expensive, work one time, and then you'll never use it again because it was such a pain in the butt to actually make it work. Kind of goes back once again, I'm trying to make this so much more boring because that's what makes it a useful 
uh, a useful product, a useful tool in your in your toolbox. All right, so with that, let's talk about the drone surveying journey. This is, I call it the journey, this is the path that most surveyors take when going from never using a drone to actually using one really successfully. So most surveyors start, or you know, this is actually changing as technology is getting better and easier to use. But uh, at least the last uh, couple of years, a lot of surveyors started by buying a drone just for taking photos and videos, recording site conditions. You could buy almost a toy quality drone for a couple hundred bucks that has a cool camera. You could take photos, document the site, send it to your clients, wow your clients, they love it. Cool, that's a great way to start. Then you stitch it into an ortho photo. That's when you maybe throw it at some software online where it takes 100 photos and it stitches it together and all of a sudden you get a base map. That's great, you get further and further. <coughs> and then you start actually increasing your accuracy and, uh, and the precision of your ortho photos by adding in your ground control points, maybe adding in RTK, some sort of uh, advanced GPS processing. So not only do you have this base map, but it's extremely accurate and extremely precise enough to actually take measurements. And then you start working in 3D, getting out your surface models, your point clouds, maybe extracting vegetation. Then going into clean, getting clean CAD drawings, and you actually start to, instead of just having a point cloud, have break lines, features, blocks, topo, tint surfaces uh, that you actually want. Getting that into a final survey deliverable where you're actually getting it into CAD, you're integrating it with a lot of your other data. And then the most important part at the top of this is getting that into this repeatable workflow. That's that part that I've been referring to again, that kind of making it boring, getting more information in there, but making it just repeatable so that you use it a lot, getting out of that research project or test project phase and into something that you just becomes routine because it's so wonderful as a time saving tool. So now, generally speaking, there are five steps to get there. Once you've got the drone and everything, we'll cover the drone hardware in a second. But there are five major steps to go from how you actually start to kind of your final flip. The first step is actually mission planning. We're going to talk about that a fair amount. Mission planning, once you know what you're doing, is actually ridiculously simple. You know where your, your, uh, your um, project's going to be. You just set up, okay, where do I fly the drone? How high do I fly it? Where am I going to set my ground control points? Some really simple things. And you set up an autopilot, which is all automated, so that by the time you go in the field, you literally put the, book, the drone down, and you press go, and you fly it. The reason we have it as its own step is because it's so easy to gather the wrong data in the field. And this is true with drones as well as with other survey instruments as well. If you don't have a plan, if you just go out with your tools, there's a good chance, or you send someone out with tools, there's a good chance they're going to collect the wrong data. Uh, but mission plan will make sure you collect the right data. The data collection in the field is the easy part. Like I said, you literally just push go. And then there are a couple of steps once you're in the office. The first is your photogrammetry and LIDAR processing. That's taking this raw data, whether it's raw LIDAR data or raw photos and raw GPS data, and turning it into an accurate, geo-referenced, geo -referenced, ortho-rectified point cloud that's in your coordinate system that matches all of your, uh, your other data. Then you're going to get that into the what we call the line work drafting stage, which is where you take these massive files, tens of gigabytes, and actually extract the data you need, making a tin surface out of it, adding in your vectorized features, drawing curve lines, paint striping, things like that. And then finishing in, in CAD is when you bring it all, uh, all back together. Because at the end of the day, once you go through all of these steps, our goal is not to get you a drone survey, it's to get you a survey. A spinal survey should be indistinguishable whether it came from a drone or whether it came from any other source. And in fact, it likely is going to use a mix of different data sources because drones not going to spot underground utilities, well, unless they're actually marked up and then it can, it can uh, spot paint. But um, a lot of this stuff is going to come from other sources and you put it together so that your final survey just looks like a survey. So that's kind of what we're all going to be covering today. Any questions on the overall uh, workflow before I jump in? Next. All right. So next up, let's talk about drone hardware. This is quite frankly the, the most interesting and a lot of what people think is going to be the kind of sexiest part out there because it's where the flying robots with lasers actually uh, take place. So first of all, I want to talk about the criteria that we use for evaluating hardware. This is really important because I'm happy to give you our thoughts. Again, we have both flown and uh, processed data from just about every hardware, drone hardware platform out there. And our criteria for evaluating hardware might be different than other people. First of all, 
We think accuracy is important, but not everything. Accuracy ought to be good enough, not absolutely perfect. One of the things that I always have uh, trouble with talking to servers is I say, okay, what accuracy do you need? And they say, I want the best accuracy possible. And I say, great, call NASA and I hope your budget is a couple hundred million dollars because that's how you're gonna get the best accuracy possible. And they say, okay, well, I don't have a hundred million dollar budget. How do we get good enough accuracy for my project? Because quite frankly, this technology is incredible. The best accuracy possible is going to come at a cost that doesn't make sense for you or your clients at all. It, and I'm not even joking, literally hundreds of millions of dollars you could spend on the different GPS technology and laser scanners that you use and unmanned technology. It's incredible what you could do with hundreds of millions of dollars, but that's not what it is. So for us, it, the same thing is true when it comes to a $100,000 drone or a $10,000 drone or a $1,000 drone. It's getting the accuracy that you need for your project is more important than the best possible. Because if all you're doing is real rough one foot topo on graded dirt, that's a whole different ball game than if you're doing an Alta survey on a shopping mall and you put all of your hardscape down to a tenth. And that's what we're actually our goal is to, to get to that kind of tenth of a foot accuracy. But our goals are our criteria is that accuracy is important, but not everything. Ease of use is also really important for us as well. Again, our job is to take this out of the research phase and make it so that you can just plop a drone down, push go, and fly it. And that you don't need someone with three days of specialized hardware training in order to fly it. Quite frankly, an intern should be able to fly the drone because flying the drone is you set it up and you push the button and it kind of autopilots itself and you're really just a babysitter to watch it for safety things. So that actually matters. The easier a drone is to use, the better it is to create a more reliable, repeatable, boring workflow. And that's, that's the reliability of the workflow is, uh, is really critical. And when I say reliability, that's not like the drone's going to fall out of the sky. Basically, no drones today have safety issues. Um, that is extremely rare. But what does happen is sometimes you fly it and then you realize that because it had a complex setup, that maybe the camera shutter triggering mechanism was not properly connected and synchronized to the autopilot so that it didn't take photos at the right interval and you have to fly it again, but you only find that out after going home to the office for the day. That's what I mean by that's kind of an unreliable workflow is when it's complex that you make little mistakes like that. So a really reliable workflow is gonna be pretty important. The cost matters as well. Like I said, the cost of the drone is important to us, but cost comes in a number of different ways. Cost of the hardware, sure, that's the most obvious cost. Cost of operating the drone as well. Does it require a crew of three people? Is it six hard-sided cases that you need to carry and plug in and move around? Uh, does it require an uh, extraordinarily specialized operator that if they ever go to a different company, then the drone is worthless because it, was, it costs so much to train that guy? as well as the cost of processing. Not all drones are created equal. Some drones, the data processing is much cheaper than others as well. So we evaluate all of that criteria when we actually talk about hardware and what our, our favorite hardware is. And generally speaking, hardware, drone hardware these days breaks down into two categories. There's DJI and everyone else. For anyone that's worked in drones, you guys are probably aware of this, uh, this kind of breakdown. DJI is the overwhelming market leader. They make the most popular drones, and volume-wise, they are overwhelmingly the largest uh, producer out there. They are typically have a very simple workflow. They are relatively cheap. They have expensive ones too, but they are still relatively cheap and easy to use, and they typically have good, but not the best accuracy. With some downsides being that it is a Chinese company. They are Chinese made. They have terrible hardware support, and you're typically not going to get the most bleeding edge technology out there of the most advanced tech. And the everyone else drones, as I call it, are a little bit different. They're often much more specialized to their needs. They are often, but not always, made in the United States or out of China. Or out of China. Um, they have better hardware support and often much more cutting edge technology and can sometimes get you better accuracy, but typically this comes at the cost with all these other ones of a more complex field workflow. They are going to be more expensive, pound for pound and accuracy for accuracy than the DJI version. And they often require much more specialized training just because they don't have the volume that the DJI drones are pushing. Ultimately, we see DJI drones far more because kind of what I was saying, good, not the best accuracy is good enough 
the simple workflow makes it super, super reliable. Um, and the, the cost side of it is kind of one of the driving factors. So there's a reason that they are the, uh, that they're the market leader there. There are a couple of different options even here within DJI drones. Uh, generally speaking, we think there are about three kind of classes of DJI drones you can get. Your entry level is gonna be a Phantom 4 Pro or more recently they have one that I'll talk about in a second called Mavic 3 Enterprise. Um, where if you get one without RTK, just kind of simple photogrammetric imaging, you, you're going to be all in about 4500 bucks. Great for small sites, really good entry level to get in. Uh, the best overall drone that we think as far as a value to uh, co like cost of value re uh, relationship is going to be the Phantom 4 RTK. You're looking at about 12 grand all in. For the record, if you Google it, yes, the drone's price is less than this. We're talking about usually all of the junk that you need for extra batteries, charging casers, all of that stuff. And then the most advanced of the DJI drones are going to be this uh, this M300 with either an L1 or a P1 sensor. That's There's a LiDAR sensor and a photogrammetry sensor. And even within them, there are, uh, beyond that, there are a couple of different airframe types out there. Small multi-rotors, which are going to be your really small, uh, you know, thousand dollar drones or so. Large multi-rotors, your M300s, they're much more cumbersome to use. They typically can carry heavier payloads and often can fly longer, but at the downside, they're admittedly a real pain in the butt to carry around because the whole kit does take multiple hard-sided cases usually. And then your fixed-wing drones. These are things like your Sensefly EB or your uh, Wingtros, another company that makes those. Wing, the fixed-wing drones can fly much longer amounts of time, but typically the trade-off, they actually have to fly higher and faster than multi-rotors, which can fly low and slow. Um, these, if I'm being honest, the last like, year or two, these fixed-wing drones have really fallen out of favor, partly because multi-rotors have done a lot to increase both their ease of use, but also just the amount of flight time that they can do. Multi-rotors can stay in the air for a lot longer than they used to a couple of years ago. And so the fixed wing drones have fallen a little bit out of favor. They, they're still good if you are doing um, like thousand acre projects, but we see a lot more multi-rotors than fixed wings these days. Um, before I jump into GNSS, any questions on hardware? I know this is always uh, one of the interest, more interesting things as people are wondering what they, they might want to buy. Especially as year-end budgets come up. Yeah. Well, they're discontinuing the Phantom 4. Um, you can't buy the Phantom 4 unless it's on the user market now. Correct. Uh, <laughs> so the Phantom 4, um, while it's not officially discontinued, it is definitely going to be discontinued. Uh, it is being replaced by the Mavic 3 Enterprise, which is going to be... Uh, I want to smack whoever the product naming person is over the head because there are multiple variants of the Mavic 3 Enterprise, not all of which will work for survey. Yeah. You need the Mavic 3 Enterprise 3E, and probably you will want the RTK module to go with it. And with the problem is that that has been announced and is likely to be released later this year, but it is not available yet. I've heard from my suppliers it's actually shipping maybe this week or next, but that's, so that's coming very soon. But you, you are correct, the Phantom 4 series is winding down. The 3 Enterprise is going to be what's going to replace it and has some pretty complex specs. Yeah, just a quick question. Are you going to make this presentation available on the BS Pillars website? Uh, yes, sir. So we are recording a video of this and we will distribute the slides as well. So this presentation, yeah, if you want to take pictures, by all means, I'm not afraid. Uh, but also, uh, the slides and video will be available to you guys and anyone else uh, as well. What about the Inspire series in DJI? It's Older, it had a time and has since been uh, superseded by these drones that are out there. Um, it really, realistically, it had a lot of things that let it work great at the time, but it's just simply an older drone that's not nearly as good even as a drone for a couple thousand dollars nowadays. Um, if you have one with the right camera, there are a whole bunch of different cameras, then, uh, then it can still be used and it's going to be comparable to one of the like Phantom 4 ones, like a $1,500 drone or so. Uh, but it's, it's not something we would recommend anymore, but it's still going to be used for if you've got one. Real basic question, but I'm just wondering, I don't know what Vicious Plane and nobody ever plans to go out on a bad day, but if you encounter a wind gust or rain, what's, what's the problem with that? Yep, great question. Um, so, Wind gusts by themselves are not a problem until it gets real serious. About 30 mile an hour winds is when you start being concerned. 
Um, and it's a safety concern. The drone is on a gimbal, so even as it's flying, the wind is kicking it around. The actual imagery is rock steady. That's kind of no issue from a data perspective. As long as it's within you know, 30 miles an hour, and you would know on those days that those are pretty rough. Uh, rain is a little bit different. Rain actually does cause data issues. The rain is falling, it gets turned into a mist by the propellers, some of that kicks up onto the lens, and it can't actually take the data. So even though some drones out there are capable of flying in the rain, particularly the M300 series, they can fly in the rain, no safety issues. Data-wise, you want to wait until it's at least not raining. Um, and find a gap in between <laughs> if it's raining to actually fly the drone and collect the data because the rain does uh, interfere with the sensor enough that from like a photogrammetrist is once everything is pixel perfect, you don't really want any free on that lens. Uh, you mentioned that now, and you discussed the, the apps around there like you had forecast that you can actually plan your weather conditions a little, a little bit better Absolutely, and I actually cover that in the mission planning, so uh, hold on that one for just a couple of minutes. So, to go a little bit more into hardware, and I'll open up for more questions even in a second, I want to talk about the GNSS options that are out there, different ways of processing your GPS data. I say GNSS because basically all drones use GPS, but they also use GLONASS and Baidu and all of the other satellite things to actually make it a little bit stronger. So there are a couple of different ways that you can process your drone data as far as GPS goes. The first is with no RTK or PPK whatsoever. This is how things were first done seven or eight years ago. You just had photos and that's basically it. And you used ground control to anchor absolutely everything, which worked, but it has the downside of, you know, it's not the best accuracy because in between ground control points, depending on overlap and how many photos and how many ground control points you set, um, it wasn't the best accuracy, but it also takes a lot of field time because you are walking around, you need to set, you know, five, six, seven, ten ground control points on each project site. Really cool that you could do drone surveying at all, but this is the most affordable, really reliable workflow, but it only really works on smaller sites. Nowadays, with RTK becoming way more affordable and way more commonplace on drones at least, like I said, that Phantom 4 RTK, and now the Mavic Free Enterprise with RTK, um, there are different ways to process it. One is with PPK, where you just post-process everything, which will typically get you pretty high accuracy, a lot fewer GCPs, and less field time, but it's going to be pretty time-consuming and adds an extra step of data processing to post-process everything. <coughs> and then there are two different RTK ways that you can use it. Actually, I'm kind of oversimplifying. There are about a million ways that you can set up an RTK or PPK workflow, but generally they fall into one of these categories where you can either set up your RTK with a local base station, which by the way, this is typically our favorite, where you actually have a base station on a tripod that is streaming corrections directly to the drone, uh, which gets you extremely high precision, we use that word uh, very carefully, extremely high precision, not necessarily accuracy, depending on how you set everything up, uh, with fewer GCPs that you need, less field time, but it is a little bit of a complex data processing <coughs> workflow, um, or you can use uh, NTRIP, which is going to be basically your network-based VRS station maybe, where you connect your drone to the internet, streaming corrections uh, to the drone, and then fly it without a local base station. We actually don't love this one, uh, using network corrections for the drone, just because network corrections work really great for um, a actual GPS rover because you can have an occupation time of a couple of seconds and if it doesn't get a good fix you just kind of stand there for a couple of seconds more until it does. But the drone is buzzing along at 30 to 40 feet per second, moving, kicking all the time. If you have any sort of ambiguity in that solution or lose internet connection for the slightest bit of time, it can actually dramatically lower the overall quality of your data. I say dramatically. It's by a couple tenths, but in survey, when you start adding a couple of tenths of noise, that's a big problem. And the longer your baseline distance to wherever the network's uh, correction station is, the worse it is. So we actually don't recommend it. It works for a lot of people, and a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of like hardware resellers and vendors love to pitch it because it's so simple in theory. Just, oh, connect your drone to the internet, and everything works. But from the data side, we don't love it just because it adds a couple tenths of error. Um, and next I wanna talk about LiDAR drones a little bit. LiDAR is definitely the latest and greatest thing because while LiDAR's been around for a while, it's only in the last 
kind of year or two that LiDAR has started to become affordable enough so that it can come out of that research project phase and into the actual useful getting every getting data done with phase. A couple of things to know about LiDAR is it works best in vegetated areas. I'll cover LiDAR in more depth later, but LiDAR provides very good ground data in vegetated areas. I look at a site like this around where we are, where there are woods everywhere, this is LiDAR country. There is no, uh, photogrammetry is not going to be able to get ground data underneath tree cover like this, but LiDAR can. Typically, real world accuracy for LiDAR is going to be about two to three tenths of a foot accuracy in heavy vegetation. <coughs> you might say, well, two to three tenths isn't actually that great, but then you actually compare it to where you're using it, which is going to be under very dense tree cover, typically with you know a huge amount of uh, vegetation on the ground too, whether it's just falling through the sticks, log, whatever. Uh, two to three tenths actually isn't that bad, especially when you are getting a ground shot every, uh, well, quite frankly, every couple of inches. Um, but two to three tenths there, and on hardscape, it's gonna be better than that. But on hardscape, the story becomes a little bit more complicated because photogrammetry has become such a good workflow as well. Which is why typically with LiDAR, our recommendation is, is to use a blended workflow. Photogrammetry right now is going to be more accurate than LiDAR most of the time on hardscape. So you should have a blended workflow that combines this data. Um, that means you fly a drone, most drones will fly LiDAR and photogrammetry simultaneously now, which is wonderful. You can process the photogrammetry, process the LiDAR, extract vegetative data from LiDAR, hardscape and photogrammetry, combine it after the fact. That's going to be one of the best ways to actually get this, uh, get the best data. And good workflows make all of the difference with LiDAR. LiDAR is like photogrammetry in that you can spend a huge amount of time in the office, but even more so because it's collecting so much data, you can spend an insane amount of time working with the LiDAR profile <coughs> to try and classify everything. And having this reliable workflow makes all the difference between a successful LiDAR uh, program and an unsuccessful one. Um, it's also worth noting to talk for a second just about the DJI L1 sensor specifically. I mentioned DJI is the, uh, the biggest uh, provider out there, and their L1 sensor is kind of the market leading, it's the most common LiDAR sensor that we're seeing out there. It is a LiDAR sensor plus a 20 megapixel photogrammetry camera simultaneously. Typically, real-world accuracy in our tests, we're seeing about two-tenths of a foot vertical accuracy from the LiDAR, with one-tenth of a foot uh, vertical accuracy from the photogrammetry, fully integrated RTK capability, and some of the most important things of why it's so popular is it's really affordable at about 40 grand all-in. That's not the LiDAR sensor. That includes the drone and battery, stuff like that. It's very easy to use, and it's a reliable workflow. So if the question is, are there more accurate LiDAR drones out there? Yes but they cost a lot more money, they're harder to use, and they have a less reliable workflow. Which makes sense to you? I'm not actually here to tell you which because we see people that are successful with both. If I have to be fully honest though, we see more people that are successful with this because of that easy to use and reliable workflow side of things. That's what really makes the difference is that we see fewer field revisits when you have that reliable workflow even though the accuracy isn't as good as possible. So that's kind of our, our opinion. We actually really like the L1 sensor, even though it is not super crazy accuracy. It's very, very good and good enough for the overwhelming majority of, uh, of land survey projects that are out there. Our favorite overall drone though, like this is great, especially at 40 grand, it's cheap for LiDAR. The 40 grand isn't cheap. And also this M300 is a big drone that's hard to use. Our favorite overall, for land surveyors at least, is going to be the Phantom 4 RTK. Uh, but as you mentioned, this, the Phantom 4 RTK, it's actually still being sold, and right now it is the best drone available. However, it is likely to be replaced in the next couple of months by this, the Mavic 3 Enterprise 3E. Again, the naming convention is kind of crazy. It is, for all practical purposes, the same specifications as the Phantom 4 RTK. Um, so when, once we actually shake it down with our real world tests, this will likely become our most recommended drone for surveyors. It is going to be again in the all-in cost, about $10,000. The way they price it is confusing because the 
drones like four grand, the RTK module is another grand, like the GNSS setup is a couple thousand batteries, a couple thousand, whatever. <coughs> if you look at it, send about 10, 12,000 all in is what the price is likely to be with this. Any last questions on hardware before I move on to uh, some of the mission planning stuff? All right. So moving on to mission planning. What is mission planning, first of all? I mentioned it a little bit. Mission planning is asking questions uh, of yourself, basically like, one, is this a good site for drone photogrammetry or LIDAR? Is it legal to fly here, or am I trying to fly on a government air force base where they do not put drones around? What altitude should I fly? What's the appropriate overlap? How many GCPs? Where do I set them? Uh, how should I arrange the flight pattern? And what data still needs to be ground surveyed? Questions like that. Now again, if that sounds intimidating, it's really not once you get used to this. It's more of just the routine of going through a checklist and making sure you ask yourself these questions. It takes about five minutes before a flight to actually do proper mission planning, but those five minutes can save you hours and hours and hours if it saves you a uh, few minutes. Well, why care about mission planning? Why am I pushing this as such a big thing if it only takes five minutes? Well, one, it'll save you a lot of field time. Fewer GCPs, less ground surveying, it will actually make shorter uh, flights as well, less time in the air, which on bigger sites can actually add up a lot, uh, and no field revisits. That's really, really the biggest key thing with, uh, with mission planning is no field revisits. But it also will save you office time as well. Correctly collected data means shorter processing time. It will get you better accuracy with fewer errors and a simpler overall workflow. Of the tens of thousands of projects that we have completed, we see we find that about two thirds of problems that we see that we see are actually caused by bad mission planning. When the data comes and we can't process it, it is unlikely to be. Although occasionally, you know, one a ground control point was marked incorrectly or was measured incorrectly, someone set their rod height wrong, whatever. That happens, but more likely it's going to be things like the overlap was set too low so that you don't actually have good data or you're trying to fly a photogrammetry drone in really high vegetation areas, something like that. Um, so that's kind of why we care. So when we ask, one of the first questions is, is this a good project for, uh, for a drone? I talk about what drones can do and what drones should do. This is that big question of, what are the project sites that are good for a drone? What are the, where is it the right tool for the job? And where is it the wrong tool? Well, good projects are a pretty wide range, starting with in the order of about half an acre up to about 500 acres. Now, that's a pretty huge range, but it's worth noting that if you are doing a single-family residential lot that's on a quarter acre or something, it probably doesn't make sense workflow-wise to actually break out the drone compared to surveying it on the ground, typically, not always. Likewise, above 500 acres, sometimes a drone may still make sense over 500 acres, but you're getting into that realm where hiring a traditional aerialist and a manned airplane and a traditional photogrammetrist is going to be cost and time effective for those larger sites. Again, not always, but usually. Or up to 20 miles on linear things, low to moderate vegetation. Dense vegetation only works with LIDAR. Again, these woods are a great example because that is only gonna work with LIDAR. Great for topo mapping, ALTA surveys, running your planimetrics, volume calculations if you ever work in any uh, earthwork stuff as well. Bad projects are going to be extremely large projects, again, where the drone really starts to just, not that it is technologically incapable of doing large projects, because there's no real upper limit to how big you could do a drone project, but it becomes less cost effective. Extremely high accuracy tolerances as well. For example, if you are doing work on a railway and the uh, client specifications are that the shots on top of the rails need to be, you know, two hundredths of a foot or something. Well, that's not, GPS isn't going to work, nor is a drone, you need your total station for things like that. There are certain things, typically our rule of thumb is that a drone can get you very reliably one tenth of a foot accuracy. Likewise, indoor or underneath overhangs or things like that, drones are going to be the wrong tool for the job. I often get the question, yeah, but couldn't you fly a drone like in a room like this? Yes, wrong tool for the job, though. Um, as well as underneath trees, again, with the exception of LIDAR. Um, I'm gonna go through real quick some uh, safety and uh, airspace regulations as well. Just for anyone that's kind of starting out, there's this framework called Part 107, which is the licensing that is required to fly a drone. It's very regulatory. There are a couple things that the FAA tells you about. Of, oh, you can fly in this airspace. 
what, what I like to say though is that uh, it, it's easiest to say that you can fly a drone basically anywhere. The only question is how much paperwork you need to do. About 97% of the country's land area is totally unrestricted, which is going to be Class G airspace, and you can fly it with absolutely no, uh, no issues or paperwork whatsoever. But then the closer you get to airports or to uh, federal facilities, military bases, things like that, you might need to file some paperwork. We can actually help with that. We've, we've flown pretty much everywhere. Like I said, most airspace is open. Oh, I'm wrong. 99% of the United States uh, surface area is Class G uncontrolled. Um, but projects are within populated controlled airspace. You can fly in everything. There you go. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, there are a couple of different things, waivers and authorizations for anyone that cares about the legalese there. You do want airspace waivers, airspace author, or sorry, you do want an airspace authorization. An airspace waiver is just a different legal process that you, I promise you, you want to avoid. Um, flying in restricted airspace can be a little bit tricky because there are no fly zones that come from the drone, from the DJI that has its own safety things, and then no fly zones that are announced by the government that you need to, uh, that you need to avoid as well. Um, all of this is surmountable, it's just kind of important to be aware of some of those things. The next topic that's always a little uncomfortable is the, the one of flying over people and what are the regulations with flying over people. Um, because the strict interpretation of the regulations says that you may not fly over other people unless those people are participating in the operation of the aircraft or located under a covered structure, but other employees in a project are not considered to be directly participating in the operation, uh, and people in moving vehicles are not considered to be covered. This is what the letter of the law says. Realistically, a lot of these regulations are designed uh, just to prevent bad actors or anyone from trying to damage other people with, uh, with a drone. Um, we see flying over populated areas happens all the time. Uh, it is extremely common as long as you are flying responsibly. What my rule of thumb is, is you know, don't fly directly over a crowded concert or anything, but if you're flying over a road, yeah, that's no problem. Pretty much everything goes there. Because ultimately, when flying drones in the real world, the FAA is looking for bad actors, not like minor infractions. All these laws are really designed against terrorism and things like that. They're not designed against surveyors. It's nice to know to speak at survey conferences because surveyors are, generally speaking, very responsible people and you aren't actually sitting there trying to do uh, crazy stuff. Um, all right, so moving on real quick then to uh, autopilot software. This is what you were asking about. What are the different autopilot softwares? What are the different tools that we can use to actually uh, plan our mission? For starters, I should point out, most autopilot softwares have really converged recently. Um, four or five years ago, they were way, way different, but nowadays they've kind of become the standard of what autopilot softwares are. Um, and my recommendation for an autopilot software is use whatever you are comfortable with. Uh, most drones, even nowadays, a lot of the DJI ones, are going to come with autopilot software built into the drone. We actually really like that because it's one fewer like source of different suppliers of something that might break. It's a little bit more unified, a little bit more reliable. Even if it's maybe not the best autopilot software out there, because it's so much more reliable, it's built in, that makes it great. That said, if you're already flying with some sort of autopilot software and you're comfortable with it, it is not going to change. Most of these have converged uh, over the same thing. You were asking a question earlier about uh, different weather software. The answer is kind of the same thing. Should you check the weather forecast before you go out to fly a project site? Yes. What is my recommended weather website? Whatever you currently use for weather. <laughs> uh, you can use weather.com, weather.gov. You can use the um, UAV forecast is a pretty cool app because it is specifically they color code things based off of uh, the wind speed and whether or not it's going to rain. It's going to be, it, it's absolutely great, but it's by no means the only one. Realistically, Check the weather. If there's a major storm coming, you probably want to reschedule your, uh, your flight for another day. And it doesn't take that much crazy, sophisticated stuff to, to visit just any weather website there. Um, the only thing that is a little bit different about the different apps out there is terrain awareness. Now, terrain awareness is going to be important, again, with terrain like this, where you have a lot of these rolling hills where a drone really likes to be at roughly the same altitude above ground over everything that it's flying. 
I say roughly because plus or minus 20, 50 feet doesn't really matter that much. But if you are flying at 400 feet above ground and then there's a 350 foot hill, well, that's gonna be a problem if the drone's flying at exactly the same fixed altitude. And that's why there's terrain awareness, which is where the drone actually goes up and down and roughly follows the, uh, the terrain on the ground. This really helps with larger projects. When I say larger, I mean above 50 acres about. That has significant relief, which as I define it at least, is more than about 200 feet of elevation change on a project. It's only available on some autopilots uh, softwares, and admittedly, it's pretty difficult to use, particularly on the DJI one. Unfortunately, the DJI autopilot makes terrain awareness kind of a pain in the butt. Uh, but for certain projects, that is going to be pretty important to make sure that you get the uh, best accuracy data. All right. Next up on mission planning to talk about is overlap and accuracy. So when we talk about accuracy, one of the most one of the things that I always talk about, or that I always say is, like I was mentioning earlier. You shouldn't say, I want the best accuracy. You should say, what accuracy do I need? And then choose your flight parameters accordingly. For example, this chart is roughly calibrated to a DJI Phantom 4, which says that if you fly at 150 feet above ground level, you can expect an accuracy of a tenth of a foot or better, uh, or 15 hundredths on LIDAR at 150 feet above ground. If you fly all the way at 400 feet above ground level, you can expect an accuracy of about two tenths of a foot, usually a little better. Um, but the higher you fly, the lower accuracy you get. Now, if, when you see this, you would say, oh, well, why don't you fly everything at 150 feet? Well, that changes the amount of area that you can cover. You can cover at 150 feet only about 10 acres per flight for every you know, 20 minute flight. Whereas at 400 feet, you can cover about 80 acres per flight. You can cover about eight times as much ground in uh, the same amount of time. Likewise, processing that data. This is going, if you fly at 150 feet, you're gonna collect so many more photos that it's gonna take you way longer to process. So it's important to usually start with the accuracy that you need and set your flight height accordingly. Realistically, uh, most projects, kind of Goldilocks zone that we've found is between 200 and 300 feet above ground. If you're doing a large scale topo, 300 feet above ground is going to work great. If you are doing a smaller project, 50 acres, you know, 20 acres, whatever, 200, 250 feet is going to be more common. If you're doing a 10 acre as built, then you have to fly at 150 feet, which is really the lowest we'd ever recommend. And if you are doing a thousand acres of just raw land, then fly at 400 feet. But mostly it's in the two, 300 foot range. Are you still limited to 400 feet? Yes, 400 feet above ground is the highest you can legally fly. Um, there are some circumstances I wish that you could fly higher, but you can't. Legally, it's 400 feet. That's one that's pretty responsive to stay within that one. Yeah, so, yeah, so drones generally, if you take off from a high point, they fly at the same altitude based off of where you take off. So if you take off, go up 400 feet, and then the train drops below you, it'll be a little more than 400 feet. It's one of those things, minor infractions, and they doesn't really care about that. This is one of those things, let's say you're flying altitude to a thousand feet, that would be a bad idea, because then you're starting to get into a space where helicopters like to fly around, and you do not want to get, do not want to mess around with that. That's a very serious violation, so. But if you go to 450 feet, no, <coughs> Yeah, Pick, picking a, a slightly higher part to take off is a good, good idea there. Or like I said, using that terrain awareness if you have a lot of world to train too. I see a question back there. Yeah, so when you get next to an airport, you know, the DJI has a really cool drive. Can you get to the details of that, what are you really overriding? What's the actual uh, implications you're going to have? And are you violating anything whatsoever? Do you stay at a reasonable height? Uh, no, you're not violating. 
Now, it's worth noting that there are honestly different tiers of restrictions even within DJI. There's fully unrestricted, there's a warning, there's a warning where you absolutely need to sign off on it, and then there's warning level where you actually need to apply and physically submit proof that you have authorization to fly there. In fact, I'll give you an example. One of the, uh, the more fun projects that we got to work with uh, at, at our company was a federal prison in northern Nevada, middle of nowhere. At the time, I was told it was where, uh, where OJ was housed uh, at the time. So uh, the surveyor wanted to work at the prison, and it's such a pain in the butt to work for a prison because you can't bring in nails, you can't do all of this. They're like, we don't care how much time it takes, we want to fly the drone. And federal prisons are also among the most restricted airspace in the country because people want to fly drones to smuggle in cell phones, drives, that sort of thing. So we actually had to get a letter from the warden of the prison, and they had to send out all the information, put the prison basically on lockdown for this drone to get flown. It took us about four weeks for us to get approval to fly over this prison, and actually had to submit that the letter from the warden to unlock the drone to be able to fly over this prison. And we got it all done, and it saved them a huge amount of time, but just kind of one of those things of, the, if you actually try and go on the runway at an Air Force base, it, you're not gonna be able to take off a DJI drone without some serious paperwork beforehand. It's doable, but, you know, that's what you kinda do. All right, talking about uh, flight patterns here. There are a couple of different types of, uh, of, flight, of flight patterns out there that you can fly that the different autopilot apps recommend. You'd either do manual flight, which realistically for surveying, you should never do manually, manual flight. Manual flight is reserved for if you're a cinematographer taking photos, maybe bridge inspections. But for surveying, you should always do automated flight. There's the standard single grid, which, uh, spoiler alert, this is going to be our favorite. Uh, often called a lawnmower or booster phedonic flight path, where you just go back and forth. There's the double grid pattern, where a drone flies one flight plan north-south and the other east-west, so double grid. We typically find that to be a lot more data and a lot more flight time with negligible, if any, increase in accuracy, so not usually our recommended way. Um, there are linear missions where you can actually set up a flight path along a line and it will do a couple of passes along the line. Really great for road corridors, power corridors, pipelines, uh, any sort of linear project that you're mapping during a linear mission is really, really great. And then, like I said, terrain awareness where it's actually following terrain of the, uh, of the project. Our favorite is either going to be single grid for most projects or linear missions for, uh, like I said, those corridor projects. Um, overlap is something that's worth uh, talking about as well. Um, overlap is when the drone flies, how close together are those flight lines? So how much overlap is there from one flight line to the next as far as the photos that it's taking? Photogrammetry and LiDAR overlap are a little bit different, and honestly, for Digital drone photogrammetry is different from traditional aerial photogrammetry. Traditional aerial photogrammetry was flown with very highly calibrated metric cameras, whereas drone photogrammetry is going to be with generally lower quality digital cameras, and that means that they require much higher overlap. Also, because it is so cheap to acquire drone imagery compared to traditional aerial imagery, higher overlap gives you a much higher workflow reliability to make sure that you have uh, everything covered appropriately. Um, LiDAR and even photogrammetry, quote, works with low overlap, but we don't recommend it. We like a little bit of data redundancy. Um, our recommendation is 75-75 overlap, which 75% front overlap, 75% uh, sorry, 75 front, 75 side for LiDAR, or for photogrammetry. LiDAR you can get, get away with a little bit lower at about 60 to 65%. We know that's a little bit higher than a lot of, right, of uh, software vendors or hardware vendors recommend. Again, we found from processing the data that when you go with the bare minimum there, you oftentimes have gaps in the data for any number of reasons. It just makes for a more robust workflow to, again, reduce that incidence of field revisits. 60 to 65% uh, LiDAR overlap is our recommendation. Be aware of mission planning with insufficient overlap as well. These are some examples of you know, projects we've seen where if you aren't actually, if you don't draw out your mission plan appropriately, you might have areas like this where you just have a single flight line, which is insufficient overlap for, uh, for good photogrammetric coverage. And then another area over here where it's like eight flight lap flights overlap, 
and you have collected so much data that it actually can cause its own sorts of problems uh, and doesn't make it any ac more accurate. Throwing more photos at a project, by the way, does not improve accuracy. It just makes it a bigger pain in the butt to process. Uh, and more photos, more flights <coughs> will not make up for bad mission planning. You can't like take a bad mission plan and just fly it three times and expect it to work. That's not how this sort of thing works. Another thing we're talking about is nadir versus oblique imagery. So nadir imagery is when a camera points straight down. Uh, oblique imagery is when it tilts up a little bit. And this, I always like this chart because it kind of shows uh, straight down you get more or less a grid pattern. If you're just a little bit off angle, off nadir, uh, you get it kind of like this. And high oblique, if you include the horizon, you actually can see out much, much, much further. But what you will notice is the size of these squares out towards the horizon gets very, very small. You actually get lower resolution once you do uh, a higher oblique <coughs> angle, um, which can actually reduce the accuracy of your project. A lot of people think obliques are great. And quite frankly, oblique imagery is good if you are doing a 3D model for like an architectural reconstruction, right? If you want to model the facades of buildings, then oblique imagery is going to be really important. But for surveying, oblique imagery is typically not necessary. In fact, it's very, very rarely necessary. Like I said, better identification of vertical features, but it would cost you more processing time and lower resolution from that, uh, from that high angle. And the resulting accuracy is rarely improved by adding oblique imagery. So our recommendation is going to be nadir only for, uh, for drone surveying projects. So to summarize some of our uh, best practices here, single lawnmower or booster photonic flight pattern, 75-75 overlap with nadir only and no obliques. Part of the reason I say this now, that, that I, I always have to put a warning out for this, it's like, well, that's good. I've always heard that big data is a thing. Gathering more data certainly can't hurt, right? Well, it actually can. There absolutely is such a thing as too much data. A lot of these mission planning apps say, oh, well, let's fly double overlap just in case. Why don't you fly a little bit lower, collect some more photos just in case? Well, that's because they don't have to pay for the field time. That's what you have to pay for. They don't have to pay for the processing. You have to do that, or we have to do that. And typically, someone has to do it. Processing time isn't free. It's more time in the field, longer processing times, larger, more cumbersome files to deal with, your computer, you might need new computers. Honestly, the solution is fly higher. Long, single lawnmower, no crosshatch, and no overlap overkill. Those will cause you so many problems down the line, and I kind of don't like that a lot of these apps are pushing for just more data, more data, more data, but that's because they're pushing the cost of processing it on you guys. And my goal, again, is to actually make this a business for you, right? I'm not trying to say, get 10,000 photos on a 50-acre project because the cost of processing that would just be ridiculous and not very really useful. Um, next up in mission planning, and by the way, we're gonna have a break in about 15 minutes or so, uh, and I'll cover it when we get there, but we're gonna break for a little bit and then come back a little early to make sure that we can get you guys out in time for the uh, 11 o'clock hotel checkout. But first, we get to talk about ground control points and GCP best practices here. Now, I should mention before I jump into GCPs, GCPs are going, GCPs meaning ground control points, the planning is going to be different depending on what drone you have. If you have an RTK enabled drone, it is going to require fewer GCPs than if you have a non-RTK uh, enabled drone. So, to start with, the what used to be more common is going to be your non-RTK enabled drone recommendations here. Generally, best practices with GCPs is you need, as a, a good rule of thumb, this isn't always perfect, but a really good rule of thumb, is when you don't have RTKs, set five targets per flight battery. And if you do have RTKs, set one flight target per flight battery with a minimum of three is going to be our recommendation three for a single project. Uh, you should have them well distributed around the project site. If you don't have RTK, you basically need the corners and the middle, at least. If you do have RTK on your drone, this is less important because the RTK can make up for a lot of that. You won't have the kind of uh, movement that you would uh, with non-RTK. Yeah? You say battery. Are you talking energy source or are you talking... Flight, flight battery. So you fly the drone, it runs out of batteries, and you have to change it and okay. put up another battery. Like I said, it's just a, so when you fly the drone and it uses up a whole battery and then you have to put in a second battery, 
Set five more targets. <laughs> you haven't changed the terminology. Good. Yep. That's that's our terminology at least. Yeah, is per flight battery per flight that you take. Like I said, it's a rule of thumb. If you get one of those crazy like gas-powered drones that can stay in the air for four hours or something, which I wouldn't really recommend, uh, but you'll need to set some more ground control points with that. Like I said, it's just a, a good rule of thumb for a, the overwhelming majority of projects. Uh, you do want to fly a little bit beyond each of the ground control points, an obvious center point, and something that's visible from our, all angles. Now, let's talk about marking ground control points. This is an interesting thing. Of how do you actually mark your ground control on the ground? Seeing surveyors all over the country and processing data, we've seen a lot of fun different, different things. So generally something like this isn't going to be ideal. It's clearly a, a tile, but it's all white. Uh, because finding the center point is a little ambiguous. We can, you can find it very well, but this adds, you know, sometimes a tenth or two tenths worth of air in the project, not always recommended. Visual ID points are really tricky as well. We don't recommend them, especially because the person that's shooting them in the field is not always the person processing it, and sometimes you forget, right? You might label your target uh, corner of concrete. It's like, oh, well, is it this corner? Is it this corner over there? Is it another corner? It's really hard to identify perfectly. Same thing even with like paint striping, the like end of paint stripe. It's a little bit trickier to, uh, to get that perfectly. Chevrons, I actually really don't like chevrons. I know some people do, it's not my favorite, partly because I didn't even realize the conventions are different. Some people will mark the front tip right there. Some people will mark the inner corner. Some people mark the center between the front tip and the inner corner. And the only thing I found that's consistent is that every surveyor thinks that the way that they do it is how every other survey ought to be doing it. So, I don't love chevrons though. Uh, this was also one of my favorites. <laughs> Quite frankly, if those are your ground targets, then please do it again. That's, that's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, those aren't our, uh, our recommended ones. Really just a cross hatch pattern. Uh, black and white checkered tiles are common. We actually sell these things on Amazon. They're just biodegradable paper targets that are super easy to see for any other grand interest they just stand out everywhere. But it doesn't have to be that. Really any uh, target of this pattern is gonna be what our preference is. Yes. Uh, this one is 16 by 16 inches. Usually 12 by 12 is about the smallest. Different sizes for different heights. Um, for a drone, because you're so limited to 400 feet above ground, you typically don't need larger ones. Traditional aerial photogrammetry, you oftentimes have your six foot targets. Um, but that's because with aerial photogrammetry, depending on the project site, you might be flying at 2,000 feet, you might be flying at 15,000 feet. So you need bigger targets for different ones. Drones are limited at that 400 feet. So we found the, that 16 inch is kind of a really good middle ground that uh, it's very easily visible from 400 feet with just about any drone and still very easy to carry around and ship and, and all that stuff. Yeah, if you're setting six foot targets, you do not need six foot targets for a, for a drone. Yeah. It's a cool product that we have found is not super useful in field workflows. It has for complex workflow, it fails a lot, it really doesn't, particularly with surveying, where accuracy and reliability are paramount. You can't like just mark one off by a foot because it marked one on the corner and just be okay with that. Um, it, it shows promise, but we typically don't recommend that workflow. It, it's a negligible time savings. Marking the GCPs is not at all the most time consuming part of a photographic project. So it's a cool idea, I think it's better, but realistically it's not our favorite way to do it. Yeah? I couldn't hear what you were saying again, but would you recommend that they put I'm sorry, can you just say those little louder? Hard point to the center of the target on the ground. Would you recommend that if you ever had to go back for some reason? That's entirely based on the project site. So we see a whole range of different things. Um, if you are out in the woods, what we often recommend is just put you know a single nail down there to hold it down, 
and then walk away and those, the target itself will biodegrade, whatever. If you're on hardscape where you can't actually touch the ground, then you take the target down, shoot it, and then it doesn't come back if you only need to do it one time. Um, usually a site will have other survey points that you can shoot again and <coughs> reoccupy and just re to use to relocalize your project. Um, ultimately, that's site specific. We recommend whatever you want. If you want to put a hard point through it that's permanent, go for it, but that's absolutely not necessary. Yeah, we need to sink that rod and we'll sink the motor there. We never went back. Yeah, so that's usually, I can tell you, it, the other thing is these targets themselves are designed to turn to absolute mush over a couple of months. So the targets are designed to not blast. If you want to add something, by all means, that's more company policy than anything. Because we, we, you can't see the nail of the head from a photo, or the head of the nail from no. a photogram free thing. So whatever you do with that, we don't really care, as long as the target's where you, uh, where you mark it. Yeah. Yeah? On the, on, on the color of the targets, and they're using the yellow red, I've seen where sometimes using the white like that we get a really bad glare. Yeah. Back in the image. Is that, you know, if we're, if we're painting stuff on the pavement, Like yeah, black and white is fine. You often do, I, white is not super ideal because it does get so often washed out. Um, in fact, a lot of other like very specific photogrammetry targets uh, don't actually use black and white, they use black and gray um, so that it doesn't wash out quite so much in very direct sunlight. Um, the other thing that's worth noting, part of the reason black and white is so common is photogrammetry used to be only black and white for aerial photogrammetry. Now that everything's in color, our photogrammetrists love this because it's so much easier to spot. But sometimes when you are painting your targets, white's fine. <coughs> if you have like kind of a, a gray almost, that actually helps a little bit to reduce the contrast. Sometimes you like contrast with super bright light, it can wash everything. In fact, you know, it's possible that that's a black and white target, but a high gloss black. You don't want glossy targets either. You want uh, matte finished targets as much as possible because glossy can do that in sunlight or bright, not even sunlight, just bright days. Well, let's talk about something else we've noticed. Is, uh, you go ahead and look at the DEM, or like a, a DJI or EV, the you know, paint stripes on the road. We, we see that the DEM, because of the intensity of the, the, the blackness of the image, the DEM does some funny stuff when you get into yep. the air. Yep, it can do that. And we'll cover that after the break when we talk about processing too, because a lot of that you can handle in the photogrammetric processing or in the line work tracking phase. <laughs> To, uh, to talk about is uh, with GCPs is GCPs with RTK and PPK data. Now RTK and PPK reduces the need for GCPs and checkpoints, but in our opinion, our professional opinion, control and check data is still required. And I say required not because it is technologically required. Yes, there are ways that you technologically could do a full drone survey without any ground data whatsoever, relying purely on the GPS data with a perfectly calibrated camera and get everything done perfectly. <clears throat> but we believe ground data, whether it is ground control points used as GCPs or as check shots, is required for the level of reliability that a surveyor needs. When you don't use ground control, there are so many things that can go wrong. Ranging from, like I said, most of these drones have non-perfectly calibrated cameras, which is okay, but if the focal length is off by one tiny little bit, it could actually move the whole project up and down by a foot or so. Because even if the RTK is perfect, that tells you where the drone is, not where the ground is. You care about where the ground is. And so you need to have check shot data to make sure that that is correct. Uh, even if you do have a perfectly calibrated camera, the number of errors that we have seen, ranging from just vertical data errors, to translations, to site localizations, to unit measurements, is just through the roof. 
that having just a couple of check shot data or ground control point data to make sure that your site is proper, properly localized, that your camera is properly calibrated. We believe that anyone pitching a drone that says you do not need any ground surveying data whatsoever, we believe that to be a very irresponsible position. Again, it is technologically possible. The only people I trust to actually do a proper survey without any ground data is going to be NASA, and again, that's going to be out of most people's budget. But we believe that some level of ground data is necessary just for, out of a responsibility thing to make sure that it's accurate and also to check for just those human blunders because blunders happen all the time. Quite frankly, as good as surveyors are, you guys make mistakes too. Having this is great because it catches other mistakes all on the ground too. When you set your ground shot, it's like, oh man, I had two crews out there and one of them set the rod height to uh, minus six feet instead of plus six feet. And so you have these two crews shooting the same site and everything's off by 12 foot vertically. That, the drone will catch that in a heartbeat. But it's part of the reason, like, yes, we do recommend, uh, we think for, to be a responsible surveyor, control data is required. So how many for GCPs for RTK when you do have this level of good data? Like I said before, no control is not good enough. You do or really should have control. Uh, is there properly calibrate the camera, localize the project, and having that ability to detect errors? Our recommendation is three ground control points minimum per project with another ground control point per flight battery where practical. It is not always practical. That is the power of RTK2. If a certain portion of the site is inaccessible, you don't necessarily need it there. Um, but it does require an RTK processing workflow. You do need to be a little bit familiar with uh, GPS processing or, you know, minor self plug. Have someone like Eric Sauce do the processing because we are familiar with that sort of thing. But that's how many you need for, uh, for good RTK. Uh, good GCPs for good RTK data. All right. And to kind of summarize what a good field operations workflow ought to look like, is when you go out to the field, when you do your mission planning, first off, you check for your, these are, this is kind of like your checklist, right, of what you should do before you actually go out and fly. Pretty simple at this point. Check for site restrictions to make sure, well, both that you have access to the site, uh, that the airspace is clear, that the weather's there. Create and save your flight paths, do that in the office. Go out, pack your equipment. We have a checklist too, uh, just for packing your equipment because Nothing is more frustrating than driving an hour out to a job site and realizing you forgot your GPS antenna or that there's no SD card in the drone. Um, set up your ground equipment, set up your aircraft and inspect it, survey your ground data, set your GCPs, load, load your mission, and then click go. That's as simple as it is. The, again, the flying the drone part is really the easiest part. No question there. You just set it up and hit go. Verify your data, and then you are done. All right, and with that, it is currently uh, just about 9.20. So we are going to take a 15 minute break. Uh, so if you guys want to come back around 9.35, uh, we can then go into the office portion of the workflow. So thank you for your attention so far. Let's go get some coffee. We are going to jump back in because I've got a ton of content to actually cover over the next uh, hour or so as we finish up talking about, this time, the office workflow for drone data processing for drone photo management. We've already talked about the mission planning, collecting the data in the field, what drone you're going to use, what hardware. Now we're talking about the actual office side of things, which includes a couple of different steps. First of all, photogrammetry, and actually photogrammetry and LIDAR as well as well as drafting the line work, creating your tin surface, and getting everything finished into CAD, into your CAD suite, your layers, into files that you can actually use. That is really the critical part of this. My goal is not to get you to, here's 10 gigabytes of data that you don't know what to do, it's to get you to that final survey. So, first I'm gonna start by walking through everything at a high level, and then we're gonna go into way more detail about exactly how to process things, all of the different options you have of how to process things, what our recommendations are, uh, and get through a bunch of questions there. Quite frankly, I have tons of content here, so we might have to speed things up at the end, because uh, for better or worse, this is my specialty too, right? Like, I work in photogrammetry, I actually geek out on this stuff. I really enjoy this type of work, so I can talk about this for longer than you want to listen to me. <laughs> so, 
Step one is photogrammetry that I've talked about. Photogrammetry is when you are stitching the photos into what we call interim files. So you start with raw photos, GPS data, and that will stitch these images together into things like a point cloud, an LAS file, a photogrammetry drive, LAS file. An ortho photo, which is going to be an ortho rectified image, that kind of top down 2D map of the whole thing, as well as a digital surface model. These are your interim outputs. We call them intermediate outputs because they are rarely the final deliverable. They are used to create the final deliverable, which is going to be a actual uh, CAD file surface of CAD. LiDAR processing as well is an additional step where you start with this raw LAS file, but you actually then need to classify your point cloud into ground, buildings, vegetation, etc. When I do start talking a little bit more about LiDAR processing, you'll see a lot of these profile views for the side where you have your vegetation in, uh, yeah, it's like a cross section basically, your vegetation in gray there, your ground in, uh, ground points in brown, ground surface in green, and converting it all into a useful format. Because one thing you'll hear from me a lot is with these interim files, anything that is measured in gigabytes is not a useful format to me. It's good to have for archival purposes, it's good to have for processing purposes for creating your final products, but it is not a final product, at least from the uh, perspective that I said. That means you're gonna have to start reducing a lot of this stuff into a CAD-friendly surface. You see under here the raw data, but mixed in that you actually have a tin surface created from a series of topo points, brake lines along the curb, brake lines and planimetrics along where the sidewalk is, with additional topo points, shots for your various utilities. These are the kind of points that you actually want to extract for a final survey. And that makes your final survey much, much, much smaller. Instead of a couple gigabytes, you're talking about a couple megabytes, something that you can put in an email, actually. And reducing everything to CAD compatibility, and then ultimately finishing it in CAD. That means you are merging your field shots, you're creating a final tint surface, adding in your contours, your annotations, your site culture, your street names, things like that to make sure that your finished drone survey is indistinguishable from the conventional survey. So, to kind of uh, summarize that, ah, there we go. Um, <coughs> you fly the drone, that's what we talked the first half about. You start with your photos, ground control data, and RTK PPK data if you have it. That goes through this step of photogrammetry and LiDAR processing, which creates an ortho photo, digital surface model, and a point cloud as well, typically. Then it goes through the stuff that we call line work drafting to extract a lot of those useful features. That will get you things like 3D points, polylines, typically in a DXF format, something like that. Go through CAD finishing, which is actually merging it all into CAD, working in Civil 3D, Carlson, MicroStation, something along those lines. Typically in something like DWG format, site culture contours, adding in your surface, adding in your ortho photo imagery back at the end to actually get your final deliverable. This is what we view as like the main workflow to actually get from flying a drone to a final product. The other thing is that once it actually goes through one of these steps, it shouldn't have to go back. Uh, it's a big time killer if you start drafting line work and only then realize that you made some photogrammetry errors or GCP errors, so you have to reprocess your photogrammetry and LiDAR and then reprocess your line work again. That's a pain in the butt. So this is, uh, this is the main workflow to actually, the main steps to get from flying a drone, getting all that raw data, and actually getting to that final deliverable. Questions so far on the, the broad, uh, broad strokes before we start diving into the details? Let's do it. So, starting with photogrammetry. Starting with the basics, what is photogrammetry? Well, photogrammetry is the art and science of making measurements from photographs. It is taking 2D photographs, finding common points across them, combining them with the GPS data, combining them with the ground data, triangulating it all to create point clouds, and creating measurements from it. The science of photogrammetry has actually been around for an extremely long time, at least 100 years or so, when they were taking photos from uh, hot air balloons to actually try and survey battlefields in World War One. I. I know, which is just kind of some cool history. But the science has been around forever, and the science today is 
fundamentally exactly the same as it was 100 years ago. We have just gotten much better in terms of the mathematics and more importantly, the computational aspect of turning it into a computer measurement that can take hundreds of millions of points and combine them together rather than having to do it manually. But it is worth noting one of the constraints of the photogrammetry process is that photogrammetry takes an awful lot of time. Uh, it takes a little bit of human time marking those GCPs, which we were talking about earlier. You do have to go in typically mark your control points, but just a little bit of human time to set a lot of it up. And modern digital photogrammetry takes a lot of computer time. Even with the most powerful computers, on any sort of reasonably sized site, you are talking hours, sorry, uh, hours to days to actually um, to actually process a large project site. And fixing an error and experimenting can take hours, because a lot of time, for anyone that's played with a project that might be one or two or 5,000 photos, if you hit go, you won't get a result for hours, sometimes overnight processing, and then it'll just tell you, oh, you had the settings wrong, or oh, you didn't quite get it right, we didn't find a good solution for the, uh, the camera calibration given the constraints you put in, whatever. Um, and improved hardware only does so much, right? If something takes eight hours to process, even if you get a computer that is 15% faster or whatever, it actually then reduces it to like five and a half hours, which still you have a lot of the same constraints. It just takes a lot of time. Improved hardware does not take an eight hour photogrammetry project and turn it into 30 seconds so you can rapidly iterate. So our philosophy and some of our principles in, in uh, processing photogrammetry is one, you should always work smarter and not harder. But two, use an iterative process. The way that we recommend any photogrammetry process when you are doing uh, photogrammetric, photogrammetric data processing, start with very low accuracy, very low resolution, very rapid processing uh, things to start weeding out errors, uh, integrating your ground control point, uh, control points, making sure that your data are all set up correctly, making sure that your RT, RTK data is right, before then stepping up to the higher accuracy because they take a lot longer, and quite frankly, keep repeating it. We are big proponents of human in the loop. There are a lot of softwares out there that are totally automated photogrammetric softwares, and they're actually really good for a lot of applications. Drone Deploy is the most popular one out there, and quite frankly, a lot of people think, I'm gonna come up here and say Drone Deploy is terrible, they're not terrible, it's a great company, they're just not really great for surveying. Drone Deploy is fully automated, you throw photos at it, they get you an ortho photo, and they can do it really cheap, at huge scale, and very fast, and it's awesome. But typically, for the level of accuracy and reliability that surveyors require, it is not good enough. And I'll talk a little bit more about the different softwares in there, because we believe that you need a human in the loop to make sure that your accuracy is there, that it's good for the that it's good QA to pass on to the next uh, level of the process. <laughs> now, human in the loop does not mean that I want a human with a Kelschplotter doing everything manually. It means that a human is overseeing the computational process to make sure that the accuracy is there and spot blunders that computers wouldn't otherwise be able to, uh, to look at. Another principle that we uh, employ a lot as far as scaling this up is parallel processing. This kind of goes back to that computer thing. I'll we'll talk about computer hardware a little bit. Generally speaking, it is better to have two moderately fast computers than one super insanely fast one. Processing large projects in parallel, having multiple versions running at the same time, is something that can really reduce the amount of speed and reduce the amount of work that you have to do to actually get everything done in it uh, more accurately and more quickly. Obviously, that's a little bit of a complex workflow. We'll go into that a little bit more uh, later on. But these are some of the principles we use when working with both. As far as managing your processing time, I talked about this before, right? Mission planning. There's a reason I always start with and hammer on mission planning, because most of your processing time is actually decided in the field with your mission planning. The level of overlap that you have, the flight pattern that you have, the flight altitude that you have. Those things matter. If you are having a lot of troubles processing photogrammetry, you might want to take a step back and look at your mission planning, because that might be the source of it. Uh, as I mentioned, there very much is such a thing as too much data, and this is where you really feel the impact of too much data. Partly because processing time for photogrammetry is nonlinear. If you double the amount of photos, you typically quadruple the processing time. Not always that way, but it's about that way. The solutions to this are, first of all, a good workflow is worth so much more than a good computer. Now, I'm a tech geek, if no one's been able to 
shut up, tell so far. Uh, and I love new computers, and a lot of you guys probably do too, because I know a lot of people want the most bitchin' badass new thing that's available. Say, yeah, I've got this hard, high complexity uh, project, I'm gonna buy the coolest new computer, it's gonna be tens of thousands of dollars, and it's gonna be so fast. And I'm here to just kind of be the, uh, the party pooper and say that usually a new computer is not gonna solve your problems. A new computer will make things go a little bit faster, but that is not going to, a new computer will not solve photogrammetry problems, uh, especially compared to the much more boring but much more practical thing of a good workflow. Good principles of ways to stage it, walk through things, a good workflow is what really, really makes the difference between bad photogrammetry processing and good photogrammetry processing, not a better computer. A good laptop with a highly trained operator is better than a $10,000 uh, professional workstation. And also staging your processing, like I said, run initial processing multiple times, iterate it, run rapid, scale up before you run full processing. As far as what hardware we use, this is our uh, kind of seventh generation of hardware. Uh, people often ask, if you are looking to buy a new computer, here is what we use in case you are curious. Um, for those of you that are very much in the know, you will know that this is a high-end personal desktop. This is about a $4,000 computer, which is extremely powerful, but it is also not the enterprise-grade, you know, twin Xeon, multiple <laughs> quadro GPU processing computers out there. Why do we have this? This we can scale. You can have three or four or five of these computers for the cost of one, quote, enterprise grade one, and actually get a lot more bang for your buck, parallelize your processing. And that, along with the, right, the properly trained operators, is going to be a much more effective workflow than, again, trying to solve your problems just by throwing money at whatever custom PC builder uh, has decided to sell you on a very, very expensive machine. So that's at least for our hardware. Oh, I should also point out, we're, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about photogrammetry. We use pix 4 as our primary photogrammetry suite. Um, I'll talk about some of the other options out there, but as part of a, you know, our principles, we don't actually try and hide what we use. We're not a black box company that says send us your data and we use magic and then send you back something. Our goal is actually to show you that this is what we do. We're just really good at operating it. That's how our, our we try and not our trust. Um, for different options of how to process photogrammetry, there are actually a couple different structures of ways you can uh, do it. First of all, there is automated uh, cloud-based processing. This is going to be things like uh, Drone Deploy. Again, very great company for its purposes. Um, it's extremely affordable, fast, and scalable, but it is typically low accuracy, no to low support, and no real great you know, QA, QC, error check. You can do local software processing. That would be getting yourself a copy of Pix4D or similar or Bentley Context. There are dozens of photogrammetry <laughs> software out there now. Uh, it's highly customizable with the most control. It is also expensive and there is quite a long learning curve to actually becoming a trained photogrammetrist as well. Or the other option is going to an outsourced photogrammetrist, shameless plug, that's companies like us, where uh, it's flexible, no learning curve, you send us a data and our photogrammetrists and CAT technicians can actually do a lot of the uh, heavy lifting for you, with the downside being that it takes time and of course you have to uh, board as well. Um, but to use photogrammetry software correctly, a lot of times people say, oh, what software do you use and what settings do you use? And I'm actually going to tell you that that's kind of the wrong question because it's not about the settings and it's not about the software. It's not like we have some magic trick, some little file hidden in the archives encrypted on our computer networks of how we process it that makes us good photogrammetrists and why it's hard for other people as well. It's about that workflow. Having a standardized workflow, how you integrate ground control and check shots, how you constantly check for errors, how you adjust those settings based on the site, based on the drone, based on the weather conditions, and admittedly getting trained on photogrammetry. I forget if I have a slide in here or not, but there is, um, it's called the uh, ASPRS, the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. It's a national organization, they're a nonprofit. they've been around forever, like 60 years or something, that uh, we are just big proponents of. If you ever want to learn more and get trained on photogrammetry, going to ASPRS.org is a really, really great way to do that. Um, Gosh, I'm looking on here. I don't think I do actually have the, uh, the slides for software. As far as photogrammetry software goes, like I mentioned, we are powered by Pix4D. The uh, 
the uh, second most popular software out there um, is actually, unfortunately, is Agisoft uh, is the company that does it. Uh, Metashape or formerly Photoscan. We don't recommend them because they are a Russian company. So I would actually, just from a personal level, discourage anyone from ever purchasing any sort of Agisoft licenses. I apologize if that screws up your app, your workflow, but that's just uh, a little thing that I feel I have to say there. There are other solutions out there, like I said, Bentley Contact Capture, Correlator 3D. Pix4D is the market leader as far as local processing software goes, but uh, I strongly discourage anyone from buying that soft. Um, so yeah, any questions on photogrammetry for anyone that has uh, been doing it? I can talk about that for a while too, because it is, really is like a PhD level science. Oh, I just didn't drink enough coffee yet, I got all the questions about drones and stuff. Um, then let's go into the, uh, the next topic, which is going to be actually the LiDAR processing as well. So photogrammetry processing, you integrate your GCPs, work through the software, but LiDAR actually has a little bit of a, uh, of a different workflow. But the first step with LiDAR processing is actually going to be creating the point cloud itself. So when a LiDAR drone flies, the LiDAR sensor itself, all it is measuring is actually distance from the LiDAR sensor, or from the ground, to the LiDAR sensor itself. In order to even get a point cloud, you actually have to process that data with the IMU that was on board, the RTK, the gimbal that's in between the RTK antenna, you have the PPK that you have to put in your base station, blah, blah, blah. That is actually quite a technical process. It is typically going to be using a proprietary software for each individual hardware vendor. That whatever you buy your, your LiDAR hardware through, you will have to use their software in order to actually go from the like, true raw data into uh, point cloud. DJI is the same there, it has a software called DJI Terra, which admittedly we don't really like, but you have to use it because it is proprietary. Same thing with other LiDAR vendors as well. Um, I can discuss a little bit about the L1 because that is the most, the DJI L1 sensor, because that is the, uh, the most common LiDAR sensor out there. Um, and going through uh, next is gonna be the GNSS and the IMU. GNSS is obviously the GPS data, IMU, for those that aren't familiar, is going to be your inertial measurement unit. That is actually the sensor on the drone that measures the roll, pitch, yaw, as well as the XYZ movement. And processing all of that together. Um, again, it's dependent on the hardware you use. These are what some of the, uh, the files look like for a DJI one and a DJI Terra. And that is what then gets you into an actual point cloud. Once we get into the point cloud, it's still going to be a raw point cloud. Raw in the sense that it's not classified. It has no idea the difference between trees or ground. It may or may not be even colorized based on uh, how, um, how the pre-processing was done there. Uh, fun fact about LiDAR, for those that aren't familiar, LiDAR itself actually operates in a wavelength that is invisible to the human eye. It is not colorized because it is not a color. It <coughs> operates in something that is outside of the visible spectrum of color altogether which is kind of cool, I think. It's also part of why it's safe, is because if it shines in your eye, your eye is actually opaque. That way, when light can't even shine through your eye. Just kind of cool tech talk. But that means that LiDAR point clouds are inherently uncolorized. They are going to be in black and white. They have other data in there, like intensity and whatnot, but there is no color. Any color in a point cloud is going to act in a LiDAR point cloud is going to come from an image sensor. And again, these drones typically fly with cameras as well, but there's an image sensor or some sort of color sensor that is on the, on the uh, payload in addition to the LiDAR sensor, and they combine them. What this actually means from a practical processing standpoint is that the color on your point cloud is of lower accuracy than the actual LiDAR points itself which is very fascinating because it means that the XY, the horizontal accuracy of the color on your uh, LiDAR point cloud is not going to be as good as on photogrammetry. This is why we're talking about, or why I mentioned before, photogrammetry remains more accurate, particularly horizontally in X and Y directions, partly because LiDAR uh, imagery, LiDAR colorization is really bad at seeing things like paint stripes perfectly if, for those that are, want to get into the details, yes, you can use intensity colorization as well, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. That's even just getting to the point cloud itself. The next step is actually aligning all of your slots. 
Uh, in LiDAR, that means each time you fly, sometimes depending on how you have done your post-processing, again, this is a little bit dependent on exactly which uh, hardware workflow you use, uh, your individual swaths might be off. So here are some examples in profile of two different LiDAR flights maybe taken a day apart that don't exactly line up properly with one another. Uh, it is worth noting that you should be aware of multiple types of shifts. Not always is it just X, Y. Sometimes there's a little rotation depending on the hardware sensor out there. But it's something just to be aware of. There's a lot of software out there as well for aligning it. If you have very good uh, GNSS processing in the first step, you actually shouldn't have to do this. This has become much less of a problem, admittedly, with modern LiDAR projects that the swap to swap alignment has gotten uh, just much more reliable. You also have to georeference it. Remember when I was talking with RTK photogrammetry that pure RTK data is not enough that we recommend ground control? Well, the same holds true with, uh, with LiDAR data as well. You want to localize uh, your project using ground control points, both for check data as well as just getting it to your project site. I don't know about you guys, how often your projects are absolute, true, exact, pure 983 versus how often you either have a fully local coordinate system, 5,000, 5,000, or you just set up and localize over a single point and you want your point cloud to match up. Having ground control is a really critical part of that workflow, again, just to make sure everything matches up. But it can be pretty tricky. This is what I was saying before with colorized point cloud. This is the colorized point cloud, and there's your raw line. <laughs> This was actually a fun screenshot to take because I promise you, I actually took the time to make sure that this wasn't a random point cloud. This actually is the exact same point on the ground as that one. Can't tell, but that's kind of the thing. You can see your uh, ground control point clearly in the colorized photogrammetric point cloud, but you can't see it in the raw LiDAR point cloud as well. So you often have to use different tricks, tricks like intensity, tricks like colorization, tricks like uh, aligning it based off of visible 3D points. If you have buildings, the peak of a building, aligning it that way. But there still is, especially if you are doing any sort of horizontal <coughs> translations, vertically this data is gonna be perfectly accurate because you can, not perfectly, but very, very, very accurate because you can bring the point cloud up or down, but you're often going to have usually a couple tenths of a foot of horizontal air on the final LiDAR point cloud is something that we see often because it is so much harder to horizontally shift it to that perfect level. And that's another one of those reasons why, especially with 2D data, talking things like sidewalks, curb lines even, um, and paint striping, and things that can't be seen in 3D, uh, we really recommend extracting that data from a photogrammetric source rather than from a LiDAR source, our personal preference. Point cloud classification then is the process of actually taking these LiDAR files that can be anywhere from a few tens of millions up to a few billions of points, which is a lot by the way. Uh, point cloud classification, this one's actually really an exciting part of the field for me because it's one of the most rapidly changing as far as where the software is going. Point cloud classification, to do it accurately, and again, that's what I care about. There's a lot of stuff that's impressive but not accurate. To do it accurately requires a mix of semi-automated and manual classification. Semi-automated means that there are algorithms that try and pick out, okay, that's a tree, that's a building, that's a power line, and that's the ground. Those are very good, but they are not perfect. They require some manual classification to manually fix it, make sure that it didn't say that something was a tree when it was actually a power line or vice versa. Same thing with vegetation. It's actually really tricky to tell what is ground and what isn't. Um, and I'll give you an interesting example of part of why software struggles with this is there's a lot of times where a human judgment is absolutely necessary to even call something right. If you see a 10 foot high pile of debris on a project site, say it's on a construction site, do you call that part of the ground or not? Well, it kind of depends on what you're surveying for. If you're actually trying to see what's the volume of debris, how much stuff is there on the site, well then maybe you need to classify them as different things. Maybe it's a pile of rocks that's been there for decades and you actually do need to mark it as ground. You don't, a human can typically look at that and say, Oh, well, yeah, that's very clearly just a car with a car cover over it, and so it's not ground. I can ignore it and draw a flat line underneath it or interpolate a line underneath it. It's very easy for a human to pick that out, but computers have an almost impossible time of saying, oh, that's a car with a car cover over it, or oh, that's a hill. 
it's really interesting how good people are at, being, at doing this sort of thing, and how much of, that, of a struggle that is to get it perfectly with these semi-automated solutions. And I say that not to not semi-automated solutions, or not to say don't use them. In fact, you should use them, but then you should have a human take a look at it to fix these things, and then they get better in skill to be able to change it, uh, to adjust everything as well. Same thing with even power lines. Uh, this is obviously for a power line corridor. LiDAR is really, really good at power line corridors and power line surveys in a way that photogrammetry isn't. So if you're ever, any of your clients ever actually need to use PLS CAD or any of these power line things, LiDAR is going to be the solution for you there. But once again, it kind of takes a human to accurately classify it. A lot of these can get very good ideas of where the power, which one the power lines are, but particularly with attachment points or shield wires or things like that, it gets a little bit uh, dicey. But overall, this is the part that I think is going to be changing the most over the next you know, two to five years, it, because there's just a lot of money being invested in here, a lot of new softwares, partly just driven by the fact that the cost of LiDAR have come down, so it's no longer a research project. There's now more demand for LiDAR processing, so companies are building new LiDAR processing options. It's pretty, uh, pretty exciting. As far as which point cloud classification software to use, people say, oh, which one do you guys use? Well, much like some of the other autopilot stuff, there really is no magic bullet. Um, these are five of the most common uh, LiDAR processing softwares out there. I should point out this is by no means a fully exhaustive uh, list. Quite frankly, if you are already operating in any one of these ecosystems, my recommendation for software would be to stay within it. They all typically have long learning curves, expensive licenses, and it's not like, oh, if you're using Global Map or oh, clearly you just need to buy a TDC license. I'm sorry if there are any uh, software vendors in the room and I'm uh, hurting your sales by saying that spending $20,000 on a new software won't change the world. But, um, yeah, they're all pretty comparable. We actually internally use a mix of Map or TerraSolid. We have licenses to some of the other ones. Those are probably the most common ones, though. Uh, but really, they all do a decent enough job. Some are better at some things, others are better at others. But no, no magic bullet the software there. Um, as far as classifying and filtering your data, that's what these softwares are typically going to be for, is actually for <coughs> learning the surface vegetation. But as great as LiDAR is at actually penetrating vegetation, getting out good ground services, it's not perfect. You gotta be aware that there are gonna be gaps. So this is another uh, profile view of a hill. This is with, uh, with automated point cloud classification run on it. So you can see it's pretty good at detecting these ground shots. I think orange it thought was like structures or something, and you can see there's some orange down there, in addition to the green vegetation. It's also always interesting to see that there are gaps. Even though this is vegetation, this isn't like a building, this is going to be a very, very dense bush of some form. That was dense enough that the LiDAR was not able to penetrate and see between the gaps of the leaves. It's also an interesting technological note for anyone that isn't familiar. LiDAR is often talked about, and even I use the, phrase, uh, the phrasing, that it is able to penetrate vegetation. That's not exactly accurate. The laser can't go through a leaf. The laser cannot actually see through something that light can't go through. But the laser does shine hundreds of thousands of points to the point where it is able to find tiny little gaps in between the leaves. And it just needs that single gap that it can go through and receive a light bounce back. And we, use, and we call that vegetation penetration. <coughs> that effectively it looks through the leaves, it's, or, or between the gaps of the leaves, not absolutely all the way through it. It doesn't have x-ray vision, it can't go underground, it can't go through snow and actually see the ground that, and that's why the densest vegetation cover actually still cannot be per, uh, permeated by LiDAR perfectly. Um, so even around here, even with LiDAR, the data is going to be better if you do it uh, in the fall and winter when the leaves have fallen off. It is capable of doing it in the spring and summer, a little bit trickier. It really kind of depends on the vegetation. Uh, the woods that are around here are actually a lot easier even in the spring and summer. The places where you really run into trouble are going to be in your more like Florida level, your huge broad leaves that can have total like almost Amazon rainforest level of canopy cover. That's where light really, really struggles. But around here it's a little bit less of a problem. Do you ever heard of Kesley? 
<laughs> Correct. I I can see. <laughs> yeah, Katsu's pretty darn dense. Uh, and then the other thing with LiDAR point cloud classification, uh, buildings, power lines, objects, and vegetation. Remember I said before that you know good workflow is worth a lot more than good software? The number one way to save time in terms of point cloud classification is deciding what is worth the time to classify. If you are doing a topo service, then you do not care whether something is a tree, a building, a power pole, a communications pole, a power line, or any other number of things. You care about ground or not ground. If that's what you care about, don't waste your time and money classifying things that you don't care about. You should start by asking yourself, is it worth the time in getting only what you need and then getting out? That's one of the very common traps that I see is people want to take a point cloud, give it off to a LiDAR tech and say, classify this point cloud. And they're going to spend so much time on things like power lines and buildings and stuff like that that don't matter because you don't care about that. Ground and not ground is typically when you're doing uh, LiDAR processing, the majority of projects, that's all you care about. Ground and not ground. Right? Even, even most topo projects, you don't care about dirt versus roadway. Some you do, and when you do, you should be classifying those. But the first step to saving time is to make sure that you ask yourself, is it worth the time? Um, and also worth noting, a lot of these algorithmic things, they have a lot of false positives on all of this. They'll call it a building, it's not actually a building. So that's the LiDAR classification, at least on the software to get into it. Um, also important thing uh, that I want to talk about next as we do get into uh, more of the line work extraction is this concept of measuring and certifying accuracy. Now this part is going to apply to both photogrammetry and line work. Accuracy is important. I've talked about accuracy a lot. I've said you should be expecting around a tenth of a foot accuracy, but I haven't until this point actually defined what I mean by accuracy. There actually are a number of different definitions for what a tenth of a foot accuracy actually could mean. Well, everyone said, or not everyone, a lot of people say survey grade accuracy. There is no single definition of what survey grade accuracy actually means. Some of you who have been around for a while may be familiar with the National Map Accuracy Standards, a very easy to use uh, way that was used for the longest amount of time for topo surveys for the government that were a little, a little bit older because it didn't require any complex mathematics or anything, and it lacked the nuance of more modern standards. Just calling something a 95% confidence interval, interval, measuring the RMSE of the ground control points. This one is actually one of the most dangerous, by the way. When we're talking about photogrammetry, PIX4D, for example, has, when you enter in your ground control points, it has the RMSE of those ground control points. The RMSE is root mean squared error. It's a measure of uh, statistical accuracy of the ground control points. And you might process it, and it comes out to three thousandths of a foot or something. That does not mean that your project has an accuracy in the thousandths of a foot. The accuracy of the GCPs is kind of a misleading metric. What you really ought to care about is the RMSE of independent checkpoints. This is going to be the gold standard nowadays. Um, let me see if I got yeah, the documents. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a second. But know the difference between a ground control point, which is what was actually integrated into the project, versus an in independent check shot which is only used to verify accuracy. That's your gold standard to actually know accuracy. Accuracy for a drone survey is typically going to be on the order of magnitude of about a tenth of a foot. The best we have ever seen reliably by any drone platform is about five to seven hundredths of a foot. It's really the best you could ever expect out of a drone. But right around a tenth of a foot is the better assumption for the best accuracy capable from a drone reliably. Uh, also talking about accuracy versus precision. I mentioned this before, this is your standard low accuracy, low precision. This is high precision uh, with low accuracy, not on the target, but everything's close together. This is actually what usually happens when people fly with RTK drones that have not been set up over a known point or not, or you haven't gotten an Opus solution or something like that. Drones can get very, very high precision with very little planning, but to get that accuracy, typically that comes from either an open solution or from using ground control at the end. 
Um, and then, of course, this is your gold standard, high accuracy, high precision. But depending on your project site, if you're just localizing over an existing point, this is actually going to be fine. But knowing the difference between accuracy and precision is part of the, uh, the measurements here when you do want to validate your accuracy. <coughs> now, for anyone that is a little bit of a technological masochist, um, the gold standard document for accuracy is the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards for Digital Geospatial Data. This is a ridiculously robust academic scientific paper of how you can measure and validate and certify accuracy for a project using photogrammetry or LIDAR. Now, this isn't exactly bedtime reading. Like I said, it's like 30 pages of that, but I can tell you the gist of it is you must use an RMSE, root mean squared error, of independent check, shot, check shots with a rigorous set of requirements uh, for procedures of setting and measuring those and for reporting. When I talk about accuracy, this is what I actually mean. I am talking about an accuracy class of one tenth of a foot according to the AASPRS positional geo, uh, sorry, positional accuracy standards for digital geospatial data last revised in 2014. It's great, this is actually a sensor agnostic. It's not about what drones, it's not about what platform, it's how you measure accuracy to actually prove it and certify it as needed. So when you say accuracy, I always take it with a grain of salt unless someone actually says how they measure their accuracy. And also be realistic. If someone says a hundredth of a foot accuracy, they are lying to you. If someone says a tenth of a foot, then there's a good chance they're actually telling the, uh, the truth here. Um, I should point out that's another kind of trick that I've seen certain LiDAR salesmen use. It's like, oh, it's accurate to a millionth of a foot. Well, the laser in a laboratory is accurate to a millionth of a foot. But once you strap it on a drone and have it buzzing around and moving and tied into this complex system, it is not going to be a millionth of a foot accurate. It is not going to be a thousandth of a foot accurate in terms of the real world on the ground data. It's going to be about a tenth, maybe five hundredths, and the absolute peak cutting edge, and even that is pretty expensive to, uh, to get reliably because of the other requirements, the workflow, the hardware, the setup, uh, the equipment, you know, quality standards, that those last few hundreds are very, very expensive. All right, so let's move on to, uh, to line work drafting. Line work drafting is one of the most important and also the most tedious and time consuming parts of actual, of drone surveying altogether. In fact, everything that we've been through so far, the actual mission planning, well, buying a drone, you buy a drone once every couple of years probably, that's pretty easy. Mission planning takes a couple of minutes. <coughs> photogrammetry, for a trained photogrammetrist, doesn't take all that much time. You get all of this data, you now have LiDAR too. You have these wonderful point clouds, these wonderful ortho photos, and now you actually need to turn it into a CAD file because your client doesn't want a 20 gigabyte uh, point cloud, so you have to go through line work drafting. That means reducing this, like I said before, reducing a rich model to a CAD-friendly surface, making sure that your photogrammetry and LiDAR outputs, which are often too big for CAD, anyone that's ever tried to load a uh, full-size point cloud into civil 3D knows that your computer will just start smoking and then turn off. Uh, and uh, same thing with just the ortho photos as well. It just doesn't work. Because um, the files are too big, and also there's too much data you don't need and not enough data you do. I say too much data, you don't. You don't need gigabytes worth of where every leaf is on the tree. You might need a single point that says there's a tree there or just a bubble that says that this is a vegetated area. And it doesn't have the points that you do need, which is going to be a single point labeled as a fire hydrant so that every fire hydrant, so that every uh, manhole is marked so that you can turn on the manhole layer and see where everyone is. Everyone is. That's the data that you do need. Uh, same thing even with topo. Automated contours are a pain in the butt because they go around and they're a little jaggy, but it's pretty good on this clean, clean surface. But then it draws all of these contours around the cars and the other things. You need to actually uh, to draft on all of that. You also, in drafting, need to decide whether to use my or photogrammetry data. Um, this is going to be a really interesting example because this one is a profile view of the photogrammetric point cloud in uh, real color and the yellow is going to be a LiDAR point cloud. And what you can actually see is that the spread on the LiDAR is a little bit higher than the spread on the photogrammetry. This is a common pattern that we would see on the DJI L1, for example, on hardscape. 
where on hardscape, that photogrammetry is going to be considerably, uh, considerably more accurate. Now, it, generally, the best workflow is to decide before you start drafting which are the vegetated areas that you're going to use LiDAR and which are the uh, non-vegetated areas where you're going to use photogrammetry so that you don't do double work. If you decide that, if you have a good set of uh, you know, rules and instructions for here's how you draft LiDAR, here's how you draft photogrammetry, then you can combine it all in CAD after the fact and get a nice little surface there. As I mentioned, photogrammetry has less noise and better accuracy on hard surfaces and two-dimensional <coughs> features, and LiDAR has much, much, much better ability to find true ground in vegetated areas. They should typically be drafted independently, often in different softwares, and then produced in CAD. Much like with uh, photogrammetry drafting, there are different methods of line work drafting as well. We say there are okay methods and bad methods. The reason we say okay is because there, once again, is no magic bullet. If there were, everyone would be using it. So there's no perfect method. It also kind of depends on the project. Okay methods are things like drafting on individual photos and then actually using your photogrammetry suite to merge those drafts together to actually get 3D points. That can be done in projects or in uh, software like uh, Pix4D Survey, for example. Very, very time consuming, but typically pretty accurate when it works. You can actually draft directly on the ortho photo as well. Turn the ortho photo into a GIS application, extract your 2D features by just drawing points and polylines. Very, very time efficient, good for drafting 2D features, not as great for topo. You can extract out of the point cloud itself, put it into maybe a topo dot or put it into Trigger Business Center, like a or, um, or a Carlson software. Pretty time consuming, pretty accurate, uh, good for a lot of uh, different applications. There are also softwares out there that use a 2.5D um, DSM with an ortho photo to draft on top of that. We think that's a very time efficient software for a lot of things, especially with topo drafting. Sometimes can give up some accuracy in other ways. But there actually are really bad methods as well. First of all, I kind of mentioned it before, importing an ortho photo into Civil 3D, we think that is a very bad because Civil 3D does not like large files. Actually drafting, digitizing, creating that sort of data in Civil 3D is really, really slow, and oftentimes you have to downsample or reduce the size of your, uh, your files. You spend all this time on accuracy, and then you lower that accuracy. In fact, that's another bad method, what we call dumb decimation of a point cloud. You spend all this time on accuracy, and then you say, well, crap, these files are just way too big for me to use, I'm going to decimate it. I'm going to bring down 90% of the points. I'm going to reduce the resolution of this imagery so I can actually draft on it. Well, we don't like that. We spent all this time talking about accuracy and mission planning to get you the right data. You, once you have your data in the field, you shouldn't be changing the density of it in order to actually do your drafting. You should gather it at the de density that you need. That's why I was talking so much about, uh, about mission planning before. So, and if you can't, if your files are too big to go into Civil 3D, you should be using a different software. Dumb definition of a point cloud is uh, not the way to do it. So, again, like with, uh, with um, LiDAR drafting, what software is there? Well, there's really no perfect software out there. We recommend you use the system that you are most comfortable with. Uh, Global Mapper is one of the most popular ones out there. You'll actually, uh, TopoDot is very good, but the extreme expensive, but they are uh, very good software, particularly for uh, point cloud-based. Uh, you'll notice a handful of GIS softwares on here. GIS softwares are great because they can handle such really large input files, large photos, large point clouds, that sort of thing. But as before, there's no magic bullet. The, some of the key principles of line work drafting is that it just takes a lot of time. Unlike photogrammetry, it takes very little computer time and just a lot of human time. When you send someone a picture of a parking lot, this is another interesting one. Say you're doing a, uh, um, an as-built for, uh, for a shopping mall, you got parking lots, you need to know where all the parking strikes are, sure. Uh, there are some software algorithms that try and digitize parking strikes, and they'll take a nice, clean paint stripe and make 18 vertices on it, so it's just kind of like jaggedy and ugly and then they'll miss the ones that are underneath cars, whereas a human can so easily just like draft lines. It's a little bit tedious. This isn't gonna be your PhD level stuff that you have to do to draft, but it just takes a lot of human time and requires good QA and good C with no real magic, uh, QA and QC with
with no real magic solutions. I wish I could tell you there was a magic solution, but there's not. It takes time, it takes technicians that are just doing a lot of drafting, a lot of QA, QC, to make sure that your paint stripes are where they're supposed to, they're clean lines, same thing, whether that car with a tarp over it is a car or a hill, that they will draft it as a hill if it is a hill, or they'll go underneath it if it's a car. As far as options for line with drafting, much like photogrammetry, there are a couple different things out there. There are automated softwares out there. These, uh, it's another, like LiDAR, it's, it's a pretty rapidly advancing field where you send someone a point cloud or an ortho photo and it uses software to do it. Uh, right now, I'm really excited about the opportunities of that segment, but right now it's really inaccurate with a massive amount of QA QC required. I have found, have not found any surveyors that are uniquely successful with any sort of automated drafting solution. Your other options are just in-house drafting, which is of course the where you can do it. Use one of these softwares. Problem is it takes a lot of time. You guys typically have expensive labor, particularly for any uh, licensed surveyor. If you're the one that's actually digitizing that, it's pretty, that is really tedious. Or once again, shameless plug to my company, hire a photogrammetrist where we have tons of CAD techs and this is what we do all day, every day, and can provide you know lots of workforce to scale up and down to your needs. That is, uh, that is what we do as a business. Part of actually making CAD drafting reliable though, and with any of these, is making sure that you actually have good CAD drafting standards. That means that when you are drafting it, you draft it exactly to what you need based uh, so that every project is exactly right. Knowing how many curve lines do you do, what density of points, range of also just things, this is always another interesting example to me of how humans and computers can view things differently and how different standards actually work. We have some damaged sidewalks here. Damaged sidewalks are everywhere. How do you draft it? When there is a chunk out of the sidewalk, do you draft it as a straight line like this, or do you actually follow every single line? Well, it kind of depends on what you need. This is also like good, uh, a good deliverable like this, which is gonna be, again, better than traditional deliverables. You can draw the line as straight, but also have the imagery backing up everything, so when you actually deliver a survey to the client, the engineer can get these nice, clean, straight lines that go all the way along, but then they can actually just turn on the imagery and see where the cracks are and that sort of thing. That's a very difficult thing for a computer to do, is to see where the cracks are and be able to interpolate a straight line. Same thing with this, drawing a line underneath the trees, interpolating with very high confidence, something super easy for a human to do, so easy for a human to do, and very, very, very challenging for a software to do reliably, especially at a survey grade where you know, if you're doing a road and there's just a tree overhanging it, it's so easy for you to do it. Uh, but having those standards to, even standards about, okay, how long can it be to interpolate? If it's one foot interpolation, then anyone would be comfortable saying, yeah, this curve line goes underneath. If it's 10 feet, maybe 20 feet, maybe 30 feet of vegetation covering up the, the curve, when do you turn it from a solid line into a dashed line that says that this was obscure? You wouldn't make a dashed line foot, that'd be kind of impractical. 30 feet, sure. And at what point do you then maybe bubble it out and say, nope, we need LiDAR data to make sure that it's there. Um, it's other stuff, part of these standards that we have really robust standards. And also, if you're interested, actually, go to our website at aerotoss.com. We publish our standards. They are not paywalled. You don't need to enter any information for that. If you want good line work drafting standards, they're available on our website free of charge. You are more than free to look at them. Because it includes things like using a human's judgment to say, hey, I see that there are power poles every 150 feet, and then there's a gap here where there's a 300 foot stretch without any power poles. I bet there's gonna be a power pole there that for some reason was obscured from the system. And they look closer, maybe look for different signs of shadows, for something that may have been missed from the photogrammetry, something missed from the flight pattern, so that you can actually mark those. Those are the types of things that are really important in your standards and in the training of your, uh, your CAD techs to say, hey, look for these types of patterns and go, go from there and draft it. That way, not only can you mark what's there, you can mark, hey, this area might need a little bit more research into it or there's a huge amount of vegetation where you think there might be a utility box or a drain, uh, something like that. Very, very easy for, for humans to do. 
I love the stories even seeing the different CAT standards across different uh, different companies. For example, we have uh, one client we work with that was adamant that we mark every single dumpster that was there. Usually a dumpster, kind of like a car. We actually ignore them. We just, when we're doing the drafting, we don't mark cars that are parked there, for example. Same thing with those, you know, little eight foot wide dumpsters or whatever, we don't mark them. And they said, we absolutely must, and it was based on their own story where they were surveying a site and there was a dumpster somewhere and they found out after the fact that there was a catch basin or a manhole or something underneath the dumpster and they got absolutely hammered by the client because their, their drawing said there wasn't anything there. And so they want their dumpsters marked and you say, fine, we'll mark all your dumpsters. But this is also a great example of just one of those benefits of drone photogrammetry as well, that now when you deliver it, the dumpster might not be marked, but the instant you pull up that CAD file, you can actually see it in there. You can see that there was a dumpster, that there was a car there. It, gives, it tells a visual story, retains all of this really valuable information. But, so this is line work drafting, but the imagery is important, and then I, I, I've been talking about this, right? Getting it into CAD so that you can actually see it, so that you can actually use it, so how do you do that? Because I was also mentioning how miserable it is getting the ortho photo into Civil 3 Well, the way to do that is this step that we call CAD finishing. Once you've taken all that time, all that labor to actually draft, extract your, your topo points, extract your brake lines, your curve lines, etc., etc., how do you get it all into CAD in a useful way? And how do you turn it into this? Because like I said, this is just a single PDF that is printed survey. In fact, this is probably a five megabyte file, which means that this imagery that's in the background is not going to be the full resolution two gigabyte worth of photo because it doesn't need to be. When you're actually working in CAD, your final deliverable does not then need to be absolute pixel perfect because you're not using it for drafting. You're using it for site context so that you can see even from this ridiculous resolution where there are cars parked and things so, so easily. And this is on a projector that's ever so slightly out of focus. Um, don't worry, I'm not knocking the IT guys, no worries. But cat finishing is things like merging your field shots. So you do have topo points, brake lines, paint striping, edge of pavement, curves. I say occasionally because anyone that's worked with drone data has found that with photogrammetry and LIDAR both, all curves kind of turn into rounded curves. So it actually takes a, uh, a skilled drafting tech to draw those curve lines and then do offsets to actually make your, uh, your four curve lines proper. The drone itself, even with LiDAR, is typically going to be a rounded curve. Actually, I'll talk about curve lines for another second because that's, uh, it's pretty valuable. When people say, oh, I need LiDAR because I need the curve lines to be sharp in drone photogrammetry, this doesn't give me a sharp curve line. Well, drone LiDAR doesn't either, actually. Most people think that LiDAR will get them sharp curves because they are used to seeing terrestrial, ground-based LiDAR, mobile LiDAR, where the LiDAR scanner is stationary on the ground or maybe on a car, but like 20 or 30 or 40 feet away from the curve, and yes, that makes the curve look a lot sharper. When you attach the LiDAR sensor to a drone at two or three or 400 feet, that data is going to be a lot noisier and those curves come out as rounded curves. So no, drone-based LiDAR does not give you perfectly sharp curves in the point cloud that you can draft. It still gives you rounded curves and it still takes a good drafting tech to be able to say, here's the back of curve, here's the edge of pavement, uh, here's going to be the, the flow line and top of curve. Flow line and top of curve almost always need to be offset from one of the other curve lines when you are drafting them. You cannot draft it directly from the point cloud. You kind of need to follow it. Again, that's part of the not super complex, but very, very, very tedious stuff. So that's curve lines. They're one of the trickiest things to survey with drug data. But then you do need to mix your field data. Boundary data, that's obviously not going to be seen from the drone. Building corners, we strongly recommend building corners because they are usually obscured by vegetation or from different angles, the actual corners of the buildings themselves probably depending on, down, depending on your accuracy needs. Monuments, ADA compliant areas where you need to have your wheelchair ramp that's absolute, you know, hundredth of a foot perfect, <laughs> or obscured areas. You then need to merge in that photogrammetry and LiDAR data. This is one where you can start to see actually you have topo points on hardscape that are going to be photogrammetrically derived, the paint striping that's going to be photogrammetry derived, and then in here we've got a whole bunch of woods that are all going to be uh, with topo shots based off of the LiDAR data. 
what you'll notice here actually is if you look at the spacing, those are going to be, you know, 10, 15 foot shot spacing on the topo points that we use from LiDAR. Now, LiDAR takes data that's way denser than that. In fact, it is capable of taking literally hundreds of thousands of points per square meter. The reason we reduce it down to this is because now it is actually a useful size. That's once again going from those billions of points in many gigabytes down to a tin surface that might only be a couple megabytes and can actually be easily shared. And anyone that is using that CAD file downstream will actually think that that data is better. It is more useful when it is smaller. It's a common misconception that more data is always better. It's another one that I have to keep talking to people about. More data is not always better because it's so much harder to use. You try and give an engineer a 20 gigabyte point cloud and they're not gonna be thrilled with you when you could give them a clean tin surface like this. So that part of our drafting, even on LiDAR, once we create that surface and classify those points, reducing that into a clean tin surface, plus additional break lines. You, you, do, you can't just do a simple 10 foot grid. Depending on the nature of the terrain, you might need to add more topo points, you might need to add break lines before creating a tin surface. That's part of the drafting process. And using that then to create a single surface in CAD. Now again, if you do your drafting right, the CAD surface will be made up of points that are labeled photogrammetry topo points, LiDAR topo points, break lines, things like that, to create a single tin surface from which you can use to uh, create your contours and that, that sort of stuff. You're also going to want to, of course, apply your custom layer templates, add in, you know, make sure that it matches whatever your client's specs and colors are, adding in your visibility and usability instead of a single point for a tree or for a, uh, for a manhole cover, you'll want to turn it into blocks, add your annotations and labels. This is obviously the standard survey part of making it more useful. And more important, the most important from the photogrammetric perspective is adding in CAD-friendly imagery. Now, this is the tricky part of you have this giant ortho photo, you kind of want all of that detail, but if you keep all of that detail, then you can't actually send it and it'll blow up CAD and it won't actually work that well. We are huge proponents of having CAD-friendly imagery in everything that you do, where you can actually use advanced compression algorithms for those of you that have heard of either Mr. Sid or ECW, things like that. That is what we typically like to actually compress the ortho photo down to usually less than a few hundred megabytes is the Goldilocks zone for getting something that is easy enough to, tra to transport with high enough quality that you can actually still get good site context. And it's optimized for context in print. It's not drafting. We don't recommend drafting, like that, the raw line work drafting phase. We recommend using the full resolution data for when you are drafting. But when you get into CAD, having a CAD-friendly version that is optimized for context and printing to actually back up your, your ortho photo. And that's what it should be so that basically the final survey looks the same whether made conventionally or in the room. And we are running out of time here, so I'm just gonna kind of wrap everything up and then I'll gladly open it up for questions as well. But to go back to what I started with, right? If your drone program isn't saving you time and money, then it isn't working. I, every part of this presentation, you've probably seen there are places that I could go deeper, that we could get more technologically advanced, that there are all of these different nuances. There's all of this long tail of questions and metrics and things that you could do to, well, what about this case, what about this case, what about this case? But kind of looking past all of that to get the middle 90%, 95% of projects that work smoothly, quickly, and reliably, that's what a good drone program is about. It is not a research project. It is not something that you should be struggling with. It should save you time and money. And to do that, you need to pick the right tool for the job. Whether it's a total station or GPS or the drone, you need to make sure that the tool matches the project that you're doing. You should utilize a complete workflow as well. You should absolutely be mission planning, collecting your data, and running through these discrete steps. If you want to call them something else, be my guest. And again, shameless plug, this is also what we do with the business. If you're interested in starting a drone program or you want to see what we can do with drone data and see if we might be a uh, help for you, we do line work. Our professional photogrammetrists and CAD techs create survey grade CAD files from your drone data. It's all per project, no monthly pricing, blah, blah, blah. That is literally what we do is data, drone data processing for land surveyors and so 
And lastly, before I close, we did do, as I mentioned earlier, a video recording of this. So if you would like a copy of the video, if you would like a copy of the slides, please shoot me an email to logan at aerotops.com uh, or drop your card off with me. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to be in touch and give you the information, as well as if you want a, uh, a free demo project, we'd be happy to process some data for you guys free of charge. And with that, Thank you so much for having me here. I'm glad to be here, and uh, I will open it up for any questions, and I'll be here for anyone else that has any questions.